month of March. The first meetings of the March are always my, uh, of the month are always my favorite because we get to hear from our students in, in choral and in voice. We get to hear from our ambassadors. And, and you know, that's what it's all about. It's all about the kids. And so it's in keeping in the tradition that we started several years ago. We have, you know, students here. We have parents here. We have public participation at this first meeting. So we get to hear from everybody at this first meeting of the month. So it's always one of my faves, so welcome. Um, we have um, with us tonight uh, Senator Brenda Gilmore, who has graciously agreed to lead us in the pledge. Thank you, Senator. Everyone stand, please. Let's repeat in unison. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Individual with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. Uh, we have established a quorum. We have everyone here tonight, except for I see Dr. Gentry is not here. Uh, we'll move into, um, and the good news is, and we have ambassadors from Pearl Cone High School tonight. Would you please come to the front and take the podium? Hi, how are you guys? Great. All right, so my name is Michael Gleaves, and I'm a senior at Pearl Cone. I'm in the Academy of Entertainment Industry in the audio production pathway. And when I was looking for a high school, I wanted a high school that would fit my career goals and aspirations. And since Pearl Cone had the entertainment theme, of course, that's where I wanted to go. So I came in freshman year, and I talked to the academy coach because I was so eager to get into the program and she got me placed into audio production as a freshman, which is a year early. So these past three years, I've been building my skill set and working to pass the Logic Pro certification test and also our college course exams. And so last year, I wasn't only, I was, I was the only student to pass the Logic Pro certification test. And also I passed it as a junior in a senior class. So that was cool. <laughs> no doubt. And also, I've been able to work with many of our business partners like Warner Music, Capitol Records, and Motown Gospel. And also, I've been able to recently work with the Country Music Hall of Fame, where me and my friend, my friend and I, we wrote a song, and they liked it so much where they gave us the opportunity to, to perform it for them at a new artist showcase with Sony Records and many top um, radio executives around the country. And also, I've been able to build relationships with people who can help me in my college career, like some professors at Belmont University. And that's real helpful because I just received my full ride scholarship to Woo! Belmont. Right. So my journey at Pearl Cone has been one I'll truly remember and always be thankful for. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ariana Torres. I'm currently a junior at Pearl Cone. Um, my pathway is health science. And coming to Pearl Cone, I wanted to find a family environment, and that's just what I found. With being at Pearl Cone, I've been able to work with Dr. Waller at Nashville State, um, take trips to UT, um, MTSU, TSU, to see their health care facilities and get a vision of what it's like to be in a healthcare system as uh, in college or whatever. Um, also with doing that, it led, led me to pick a pathway in military nursing. So I'm hopeful that with working with Pearl, I've already received my OSHA certification and I'm also my HOSA chapter president at Pearl Cone. So with receiving all of that, Pearl has built me to have stepping stones to become a military nurse, and that's my end goal. Thank you. Good evening. Um, my name is Benjamin Sowell. I am also a junior at Pearl Cone. Um, at first, I just thought Pearl Cone was just going to be regular high school. 
Um, but I never knew what Pearl had to offer. So my freshman year, I started looking around and seeing what what fun, what was there fun to do at Pearl. So I always had an ear for music and an eye for entertainment. So I got into the entertainment industry with Mr. Caldwell and started a lot of mess between us and the freshmen and the upperclassmen. We ended up doing a battle of the... I guess singers and freshmen came on top. Uh, um, after that, my sophomore year, I did dual credit. I did um, Warner internships, and last year and this year, I've been doing a internship for, with Capitol Records and Motown as well. Um, my future plans are to go to Belmont University with a full ride and go into the music field for A and R. So yeah, that's my Also, we uh, rumor is that the Whites Creek High School ambassadors are here tonight as well. Would they please come to the podium? Good evening. Hello. My name is Tiffany Littlejohn and I'm the Academy Coach at Whites Creek High School and I bring you greetings from Cobra Nation and on behalf of Dr. Bailey and our wonderful staff, I would like to present to you our ambassadors. We have Clayton Jones, Haley Kemper, Mackenzie Tuxen, and Tahil Sage. Hi, how are you? How y'all doing? Um, my name is Tio Sage. Um, when I chose to come to White Creek High School, I really, really was very interested in challenging myself academically. Um, I found since I moved to Nashville, I didn't really have much of a challenge in any of my uh, general ed classes, but White Creek offers a program called the Cambridge Program where we learn, uh, we have like a really, really, really rigorous program. Uh, the curriculum is straight from um, Cambridge in England, and I <laughs> I cannot stress enough how I feel like White's Creek and the environment that we have there has been, has really got me ready for college or got me ready just to be resourceful. Um, the things that you have to do in those classes, just the way you have to think on your feet, critical thinking and just things like that, being able to be a leader within your classroom by taking you, like, by being the one who steps forward and makes all the right decisions for yourself. You get really basically total control over keeping yourself above water, um, as well as Rice Creek is a community environment. We're not a very big school, but I think we make a lot of big impact. Uh, we produce a lot of great leaders just because of the fact that we have a very, very, very close knit system, even with our academy. So, um, I personally was a, I was the freshman body principal president. I was the sophomore body president. And this year, I'm just an ambassador. But I think that when I graduate and when I go out into the real world, I think White's Creek has prepared me optimally for what I can do and what I will do moving forward. Good afternoon. My name is Haley Kemper. I'm a senior at Whites Creek High School and I'm in the Academy of Alternative Energy Sustainability and Logistics. I'm coming for you today to speak on my leadership growth through Whites Creek High School. I will say as a freshman, you would not catch me speaking before you today at all. Through the staff 
Air Force JROTC, and being an ambassador this year, I've been put in a lot of public speaking situations and a lot of, a lot of times I've been brought out of my comfort zone, but only in the best way possible. I would like to point out a few things that I've been through that have helped impact my Whites Creek High School experience. For example, this year I'm the president of the student impact team. And a lot of people don't know what that means because a lot of schools don't really offer it. And I am proud to say that our school does. I'm the president of it. And what we do is we make sure that the student's voice is heard. We make sure that every student's voice is put back into our academy to benefit not only our academy, but our Kroba family as well. I would like to say that we go to, we run the meetings every, I would like to say every other A day, we get a chance to talk to the students. That is completely student led by me, myself, and my other SIT team members. We take a series of questions. We ask them what they would like to see change, what they like about the school, what they don't. And we take that and we have, I think, a monthly uh, staff meeting with our academy and we put it back into play. So anything that the students tell us that they would like to see, we make sure that it's heard. So that is one thing that I will say that I've really enjoyed about my experience here at Whites Creek. I'm also the first sergeant in JROTC, and with that comes a lot of responsibility, as most of you might know. I am responsible for all of the recognition that goes on in ROTC, so I'm put in high standards and high responsibility, and I've never taken that for granted at my school. They've taught me so much, and I'm so grateful for that. I also want to close out by saying a few things. <coughs> One, thank you for giving me the chance to speak in front of you today. It has been an absolute honor, and I hope that all of you have an amazing and blessed day. Thank, Thank you. you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, first off, I'd like to say for thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak in front of you today. My name is Clayton Jones. I'm a senior at White's Creek as well. I'm in the Academy of Community Health and Law, and I'm in the Teaching as a Profession Pathway. My story is a little bit different than everybody else's at White's Creek. Um, I came to White's Creek halfway through my freshman year um, from out of state, and White's Creek was truly a different um, environment, demographic, setting, everything. It was not what I was used to. Um, I then set out to find something closer to my comfort zone, um, applied for multiple different magnet schools in the district and um, all of that. I ended up being zoned for a different school, getting accepted to two other magnet schools in the district, and ended up turning it all down to stay at White's Creek at the start of my sophomore year, um, just because of the opportunities that I was going to gain at White's Creek and definitely have gained since. Um, going into my sophomore year, I became an ambassador. So I've been an ambassador for three years now, and that ambassador um, role really sparked the leadership in me. Um, from there on, it only got better. My junior year, I was an ambassador, and I was also junior class president. Um, um, with the help of many of my teachers at Whites Creek, um, they encouraged me to apply for Tennessee Governor School for Prospective Teachers, in which I was one of 24 students across the state of Tennessee to go stay a month at UT Chats campus this previous summer and gain um, three hours of college credit towards my teaching degree. Um, <coughs> Coming into my senior year, I am now our student body president. I'm an ambassador, and I get to work firsthand with Dr. Bailey on a day-to-day -day basis. I do the announcements every morning, every afternoon, and I get tons of leadership guidance from Dr. Bailey, um, especially since his role is one that I would like to be in one day. And um, <laughs> it's, it truly is a learning experience. Um, it has been throughout, and it's definitely helped shape me into the person that I am today, giving me the quality that I have today and is preparing me for a lifetime of success, truly. So thank you for allowing me to share that with y'all tonight. sustainability and logistics at White's Creek High School. At White's Creek, I am the Wesley Rice Student Advocate for the State of Tennessee. I have served as a varsity cheerleader for three years, a member of Education and Law Student Impact Team, a member of the Honor Society, freshman homecoming attendant, school ambassador for the district and as vice president of my sophomore and president of my junior classes. 
I am Mackenzie's mom, Tamara Tuxon, and I wanted to tell you about her leadership role that's been available, that she has actually been able to participate in by attending Whites Creek High School. Mackenzie is Student Advocate of the Year for the State of Tennessee. She was able to take those skills that she advocates in the community. There's a, Mackenzie is aware that there's a shortage of speech pathologists in the school, in the school district. Boo -boo. <laughs> So she is allotted an hour at Vanderbilt University to educate all of the students that are getting their master's in speech pathology and encourage them to come to the school district and not to just take private, but to consider coming in the school district. Mackenzie is a keynote speaker for Blue Cross Blue Shield. She encourages the insurance company, the stakeholders, to continue to invest in the student's ACC devices, which is the communication device that she uses today. She also goes to the, on to the state level and advocates for disability day on the Hill. She was actually able to see um, Representative Harold Love not once but twice to talk to him about assistive technology and how important it is. And also she is organizing a visit for not only her but for her class next year to attend and also to go and visit him. We would not be able to have take advantage of these opportunities if it had not been for Whites Creek opening the door for her to be such a leader <laughs> at, at the school. Um, Mackenzie also it participates in the hub visit that we had actually did today, and she's the first one to ever um, be op open up the door to have the inclusion piece to educate out the other people that come in to visit the school to educate them on how important it is for someone with exceptional needs to be included. Last but not least, Whites Creek was actually on the stage for the largest transition conference in the state of Tennessee. They were able to present to represent by showing the inclusion piece for cheering, not only cheering, but also her being an ambassador for the district. Um, I want to tell you this too, they have also helped me as a parent to grow. They really have. They've allowed me to have the opportunity to participate in the schools, in the school, to become a leader, to help to continue to be a leader, and to be able to take what I've learned on the outside and educate other people to encourage them to come to White Street and to go to the public schools. We would like to tell you thank you. We greatly appreciate this opportunity, and we'd like to see other students with exceptional needs so that next year when McKenzie <laughs> runs for Clayton's job, since he wants Dr. Bailey's job, <laughs> then we can continue this. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. for coming. Thank you. People make my uncle look good. He's really not obvious. Thank, Thank you for so being here. So you are amazing. We help to transition to a college. They have colleges and students with exceptional needs. So the next step at Vanderbilt or either at the university. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We will have uh, Ms. Ms. Bush speak to uh, the choir that we got to hear, the Mountain View Elementary School Choir. Yes, I am so, so proud of my babies from Mountain View Elementary Choir. I do have one baby that stuck around. She's my little sweetheart. Lydia, can you get up and, make, and take a bow for us? <laughs> yes. Choir Elementary is um, under the direction of Miss Danielle Taylor and Samantha Sharp. They were uh, they they did sing Bonza 
Ava, The Wind and Fire, and All Jazzed Up, and they sure did jazz it up. <laughs> Miss Taylor was selected as a 2020 CMAF Music Teacher of Excellence. Is she here? Are they here? Or did they leave? They probably left. It's time for school tomorrow. I got you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bush. We'll have Ms. Bug speak to the ambassadors from um, Proco. Do you have anything you want to say? Shoot, yeah. I'm just going off the fly. Sure. So Pearl Cone is one of my schools, and it is a neighborhood school that is, they've produced many, many songs. They've performed with Keith, Keith Urban. As you heard from them, they've been in, uh, engaged in internships that are nationwide. So we just thank the Pearl Cone family for continuing to support those students. We know that that was an area that was unfortunately hit from the tornado. So to see those students' resilience and see them here today is a testament to their grit, their work ethic, their resilience, and that of their parents and the staff of that school. So thank you for Pearl Cone. Thank you, Ms. Harrington, and everyone that supports that administration. Gentry is not here to speak about the uh, ambassadors from Weiss Creek, but I think they did a really good job all by themselves speaking for themselves. So another round of applause, please, for the Weiss Creek High School. Thank you. Uh, we will now move into our public participation portion of the meeting where we have uh, people who have signed up to speak um, in, at the board meeting. Uh, they will, in the interest of time, speakers are requested to limit their remarks to three minutes or less. Comments will be timed and you will hear our bell. And the names are listed on the monitors across the room. So as you see your name, please approach the podium so that we can um, make sure everybody gets their uh, 15 seconds of fame, so to speak. So first on the list is Catherine Green. Is Catherine here tonight? Oh, no, Catherine. Okay, Laura Dietrich. Laura Dietrich. Is she not here tonight either? Okay. We have uh, Siles Lowe. Thank you. Good evening. I appreciate your time. Uh, I really, uh, I'm, I appreciate your time. Um, I'm here because I want teaching to be better and I want every class to be staffed by qualified and quality educators. I'm a 14 year educator and currently work at Davis ELC as an early childhood exceptional education teacher. This is my last year in the field. Uh, add one more to the 160 plus vacancies in uh, Metro. I'm a good teacher. I'm who you want. I'm patient. I'm positive. I'm empathetic. I'm eager to learn. I'm a firm believer in evidence-based practices and I'm passionate. I work at a great school with great staff and amazing families and it's not enough to keep me. I've heard a lot about respect in this district. I have not felt respected. I, uh, do you know how to show respect in our society? Pay people a wage that is living and commensurate with the value they provide their community. Nashville is failing to do that. You are demanding a high quality product from teachers without paying for it. Teachers bear the weight of that incongruity. You want to model your BMW, but are offering Vespa prices. I know you can't increase our pay. That's not your purview, but what you can do is prove the working conditions. And I would argue that's imperative for you to do that. Here's my proposal. We respect your time. It would be a campaign that would explicitly communicate regularly to Nashville Metro employees that they don't want teachers to work past their contract time if it's avoidable. Posters that say, is it time to clock out? Emails that implore teachers to leave work uh, at work and take nothing home. Tell teachers that what doesn't get done doesn't get done. It's okay. Remind teachers they're paid for 37 and a half hours a week. Say, we respect your time. We can, you can't pay us more, but you can set an expectation that our time be respected. Help take away the constant pressure that teachers don't feel good enough. Remove the stigma that teachers shouldn't expect to be treated as professionals. If you think this proposition sounds absurd, I think that what teachers are expected to do for our pay is absurd. Um, above all, EAs need to be treated better. They're asked to do some of the heaviest lifting in education, and many I know work a second job. How can they be expected to bring their best for our children under those conditions? I mean, it, <laughs> Yeah, um, you're not going to you're going to continue to not fill positions in this district with the conditions as they are. Uh, teachers and EAs, many of whom work multiple jobs, work too hard to barely get by. Please respect our time. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Scott Burns. Um, good evening, Chair and members of the board. My name is Shiloh Burns, and I work at Mount View Elementary School in Antioch, Tennessee. Um, Nashville has students from more than 130 countries enrolled in our schools, 
MNPS is currently home to more than 32,000 families from non-English language backgrounds, and that's more than 30% of our MNPS families that speak a language other than English. And that number increases every year. Based on the increase in the district's English learner population, we need to increase the number of parent outreach translators to support our families. There's currently a proposal for an investment of $820,000 for an additional 20 translators under the community and parent engagement priority in the 2020-2021 aspirational budget. And I'm here tonight to thank you for considering the proposal of this investment and to ask you to keep it as a top priority. In my classroom, there are at least five languages spoken at home amongst my students and this at times can make it difficult to communicate with the families of my students. But thankfully, we have parent outreach translators in order to facilitate the communication necessary to ensure the students are receiving what they need at school and at home. Unfortunately, our translators are stretched very thin, which is making wait times long and making communications with families difficult. I'm very fortunate to have school-based translators because I work at a school with a high population of English language learners, and I'm able to form relationships with the translators and the translators are able to form relationships with the families and the students. However, this is the first year I've had students who speak languages other than the one serviced at my school. Um, so to communicate with their families, I have to put in a request with translation. And for written translation, it could be a wait time of up to six weeks to get that communication back. Um, and while this meets the legal requirement of communication, it is definitely lacking the personal touch needed to form relationships with families and students. So I'm now experiencing firsthand what others with less of an English learner population have been experiencing for quite some time. Um, Currently, there are over 32,000 MMPS students with non-English language backgrounds in MMPS with only 65 parent outreach translators to support them. Our current ratio is one translator per 492 students. Um, if you look at the top languages spoken in our district, um, with Spanish, there is one translator per 619 students. With Arabic, there's one translator per, 400, uh, for, per 334 students. The BEP formula funds English learner translators at a ratio of one per 200 students, as identified on page nine of the BEP handbook. So by adding 20 additional translator positions, it would bring our average ratio of one translator per 376 students. With the high and increasing volume of families with additional language needs in MMPS, we desperately need more translators. When communication is personal, educators are better able to support the students, parents are better able to provide reinforcement at home, and students are better able to succeed and grow. Thank you for your time. Thank you. <clears throat> Armando Ar Arzat? Hi, my name is Armando. I'm going to speak in Spanish, but she's going to help me to translate in English. Uh, hola, buenas tardes a todos. Estoy aquí y quiero preguntarles, ¿cómo se sienten ustedes al saber que después de 10 meses aún no he podido cobrar el dinero del trabajo realizado en la escuela de McMurray Middle School? Y quiero decirles también que yo me siento muy frustrado, pues la verdad es que no entiendo cómo es que le estamos enseñando a los alumnos de las escuelas a que estudien, tengan una carrera y aprendan a robar a la gente vulnerable como yo que hacemos el trabajo duro. Y también quiero decirles que estamos en apoyo, mi grupo y yo, a, con los maestros y vamos al rally del 16 de marzo con ellos. Gracias. Good, good evening, my name is Armando. Thank you for allowing me to return to the board. I would like to ask, how do you feel to know that even after 10 months, I still have not received the payments for the jobs that were done for McMurray Middle School? I feel very frustrated. I hate to imagine that we're teaching students the importance of education to become a professional and steal from the most vulnerable, who are us, the ones who usually do the handiwork. I would like to express that me and my workers would be at the rally at the 16th of March in support of M&A. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. chair and members of the board and Dr. Battle. My name is Andrew Record and I live at 2804 Belmont Boulevard. I teach at Apollo Middle School. It's been a hard week for Nashville. <laughs> Thank you for your leadership this week. Thank all of you. We're back in school now, but things still feel far from normal. Students 
and school staff across the district are still without homes. We're watching the news as schools all over the country close to slow the spread of coronavirus. So it's been hard to regain a sense of normalcy. But then again, was normal that great to begin with? Normal was, the last time I checked, 160 certificated vacancies in Metro. Normal was 3,000 Metro students without homes. Normal was 20,000 Nashvillians without health insurance. So let's not propose a budget that takes us backward to normal. Take us forward to make our schools what we deserve them to be. Let's do our part to create a moral budget for our city. We might not know the full scope of what we need yet. I know y'all are waiting on a study from the mayor's office. But we already know that we need significant change. And we know that that is going to take bold action from you. I want to close by reminding the board of my friend Armando Arsate. A minute ago, I was talking about how far things are from normal. For Armando, things haven't been normal for 10 months. He still hasn't been paid a dime of the $43,000 in wage theft claims for his work on McMurray Middle School. Why? How has this been allowed to happen? How long will you allow this to continue? Also, did you know that Orion Building, Orion Building Corporation, the general contractor responsible for the McMurray renovations, was recently awarded another contract by Metro? According to public records, y'all contracted Orion to do some upcoming work on the National School of the Arts. Why are you still working with a contractor who is allowing their workers to be stolen from? Dr. Battle, you stated that there were measures in place to prevent wage theft from happening on MNPS properties in the future. But if Armando and his team still haven't been paid, how do we know that workers at the Nashville School of the Arts won't be stolen from, won't be stolen from by your contractor, Orion? Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good evening, MMPS School Board members. My name is Logan Kelton. I am both a teacher and resident in District 9. I am here this evening to speak to you all of my staunch support for Dr. Adrian Battle. Since Dr. Battle began serving in the role of Interim Director of Schools in April of 2019, I have seen and felt such an improvement in the culture of our school district. Dr. Battle has proven that she is here for the students, teachers, support staff members, school leaders, and all other stakeholders who are working to serve our 86,000 plus students each and every day. I am in my eighth year of teaching in the district, and I have truly never been so pleased with the superintendent as I am with Dr. Battle. Until Dr. Battle assumed her current role, I had admittedly begun considering the options of seeking employment in another school district. I say this because I felt my voice was not being heard and that the pleas my colleagues and I were making on behalf of our students were falling on deaf ears. Teacher working conditions, also known as student learning conditions, were progressively going from bad to worse. This entire tone changed when Dr. Battle stepped into the role of superintendent. She stepped up at a time when our district was painfully hurting and employee morale was the lowest I had ever seen it. Immediately, Dr. Battle got to work on addressing the issues we are facing and has been so proactive in mending our district ever since. When she sends out emails, I feel like she is speaking to me directly. Her tone is professional, yet so personal at the same time. With Dr. Battle now at the helm, the mere thoughts of pursuing employment in another school district are no longer even in my mind. She has given me so much hope and confidence in the future of MNPS. Our city faced a catastrophic tragedy early last Tuesday morning when a deadly tornado ripped through the communities of North Nashville, East Nashville, Donaldson, and Hermitage. As soon as daybreak hit on Tuesday, Dr. Battle was out in the heart of the hardest hit areas to assess the damage to school buildings and survey the needs of our families who were affected. Through her impeccable leadership skills, our district was able to coordinate multiple efforts to assist families in need. Dr. Battle's actions always match her words. While I was out serving one of the impacted communities last week, it was very heartening to see Dr. Battle serving in another impacted community. She truly put the needs of her students, families, and staff first, and that speaks not only of her tremendous leadership abilities, but of her character as well. 
As a career-long member of MNEA, I am very impressed by the partnership Dr. Battle and her team have established with our new MNEA leadership as well. There is such a vested interest between both parties for our district to be the best it can be. This is a partnership I have never before seen until this year. Like Dr. Battle, I too have lived in the city of Nashville my entire life. I consider it the greatest honor to now have the privilege of serving our public school children each day. Since I began working for MNPS in 2012, I have never felt so hopeful or confident in the future of our district as I do under the leadership of Dr. Battle. It is my sincere hope that you all will make the wise decision to hire Dr. Adrian Battle as our next permanent director of schools. Thank you all for your time this evening, and Dr. Battle, thank you for your phenomenal leadership. Thank you all for your diligence in MNPS. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Nancy Holland. I am a resident in School District 9. Uh, I'm also speaking in favor of hiring Dr. Battle as the regular director of schools. I had 24 and a half years of full-time classroom teaching experience in MNPS. This is my third year as a substitute teacher. Talk about stepping out of your comfort zone. Um, during this 27 and a half years, there have been five directors of schools, plus Mr. Henson has been recruited two times as an interim. So if you add that number in, that's seven. Um, out of the five regular director of schools, four of them came from a search firm. The priority of the search firm is to get their clients a job. It was obvious with all of these that they really wanted to pad their resume more than they wanted to educate children in our community. The school level impact has been disastrous. Uh, administrators, principals, teachers have been capriciously transferred and this has created some chaotic environments. It has destabilized our district. We desperately need to get some stability back. We don't need to rotate another group of directors of schools. We need somebody committed to doing the job here in Nashville. And Dr. Battle is that person. My predecessor, Mr. Kelton, mentioned the tornado actions. I was flooded out in 2010. That was in May of the school year. There was no interest or compassion for Metro employees, and I was not the only one going through that disaster. Um, it's so nice and so encouraging for me to see a director of schools who is really interested in the employees and the community and verbalizes that interest and follows it up with actions. So I also hope that you will hire Dr. Battle as our regular director of schools. We need to get our schools stabilized. We're doing a great job. I mean, children are learning, as you can see from what we had here tonight. Children are learning, and great things are happening. But even better things can happen, and more great things can happen with the right person in charge. And Dr. Battle is that person. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Nita Jor, and I'm a teacher, and this is my 52nd year of teaching. Wow. And Thank you. I'm going for one more year. I just wanted to tell the gentleman that left a little while ago, my first year I taught, I made $6,500 a year. And I thought that was fantastic. My rent was 50, my car payment was 48. So I really, I made it then. So pardon me for sidestepping. I'm also here to support Dr. Battle in the decision to make her our permanent director of schools. Like presidency, I think we need a woman. <laughs> I personally don't know Dr. Battle, and Dr. Battle does not know me, 
but we do know each other. You see, Dr. Battle has been in my place in the classroom. She's been in an administrator's chair in the schools, and she's also been in my place as a wife and mother, realizing the importance of sharing all of those responsibilities and jobs. She can understand the trial and tribulations and the joys and celebrations of working as a teacher or an administrator in Metro schools while still fulfilling her obligations as a wife and mother. She knows Nashville students and the environment each come from. She sees the challenges of the entire district. She faces those head on. I, um, I heard Dr. Battle speak at, I think it was MNEA. We had a question and answer. And I was so impressed with um, not only the questions that I wished I could have answered, asked pers um, in, the, in the crowd, but I answered, asked them personally to her later on. And she never hesitated to give me an answer or said, I'll find out for you. She cared, and to me, I'm a kindergarten teacher. And many times kindergarten has felt like the low men on the totem pole, the low priority in the school system. I think they're the best that be. I think that's where your foundation is laid. Um, we get many messages from central office, emails. And I'm less hesitant to say, sometimes I just read the bold print and skim right over it. But one caught my eye because it was addressed, Dear Anita. And I thought, hey, I'm important. I read it word for word, and I appreciated it so very much. I felt that I was important enough to be addressed as my personal name. I could go on and on in my time, ooh, but it's coming to an end. <laughs> we don't need somebody coming to our district from distant air areas, as other people have spoken. We've had the right person right here, right in front of us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Elizabeth Bug? Is Elizabeth here? Yes, Hello, Chair. My name is Elizabeth Bug. I live in Nashville on 3410 Clarksville Pike. I'm here on behalf of my son. He goes to Cumberland Elementary School. He is in first grade right now, and we moved to Nashville about four months ago. So it's been a big change for both of us, but I regret to say that his time at school so far has been very negative. Um, he has had several occurrences of bullying on his bus, mentally, physically, all of the above. And I have um, I've spoken with the principal about these matters. I've spoken with the bus driver numerous times. Um, I would, I'm asking for funding for a bus monitor for this bus because it has come to my awareness that he is not the only child getting bullied on this bus. And it is so severe that we've had two neighbors um, complain of this as well for their children. And I'm just concerned for the safety of my son. And so far, these past four months, he has not been safe. And I would just like to see some changes happen to where there can be someone on that bus to be watching over the children. Because the bus has, as the bus driver has told me, <clears throat> she cannot do it all. So I'm just asking on behalf of my son that he has some support on the school bus. Thank you. Thank you. Fletcher? Tiffany Fletcher? Lydia Burrs? Is Lydia here? Good evening, Dr. Battle and members of the board. My name is Lydia Burris, and I'm a social worker with the Education Rights Project in the Public Defender's Office. I provide educational advocacy for students with mental health diagnoses and disabilities that are currently involved in the juvenile justice system or at risk of involvement. I'm also a member of ACE Nashville and Passage, and you should have already received a letter from both of those organizations. I want to thank you, Dr. Battle, and the board for your leadership and the decisions that you made this past week. You put students and staff first, and I appreciate your direction during a really difficult time. 
As you continue to make decisions that impact our district, we ask that you reconsider changing the discipline policy during this school year. As a member of Passage who spent more than 30 hours last year talking about revising the discipline matrix, I ask that you reconvene our discipline task force of both MNPS staff and local stakeholders to review how the current policy is working and to propose changes that will make the discipline matrix more effective to meet the needs of both students and staff. We also appreciate your willingness so far to hear passages in ACE Nashville's concerns and for the adjustments that you've already made to the suggested policy changes. We continue to have concerns that revising the policy in the middle of this school year will create further disparity among already marginalized students, particularly students of color, students with disabilities, and students who have experienced trauma and stress. Students are most successful when they attend schools that provide safe, stable, and nurturing environments and relationships. Exclusionary discipline can create disconnection for children with school and can exacerbate symptoms of trauma for those who have been previously exposed to adversity. Students who need the most support will be more at risk for suspension and expulsion instead of being provided the support so they need to be successful and make meaningful progress. Furthermore, changing the discipline policy in the middle of the year without increasing staff, training, and resources will not effectively meet this district's desired goals in addressing challenging student behaviors and teacher retention. Interventions that focus on creating strong student-teacher connection and relationship are more effective long-term than the use of exclusionary discipline in the short term. They're also more likely to improve academic outcomes for, and foster a more positive, cohesive school culture and climate for students and staff. Warner, Napier, and Fall Hamilton Elementary Schools have been able to effectively reduce discipline incidents and increase test scores by utilizing trauma-informed and restorative practices and approaches. In addition to allowing time for the discipline task force to review and suggest revisions to the discipline policy, policy and matrix, I ask that you increase support for trauma-informed care and restorative practices for all of our schools. We know that effective policy change must be partnered with increased supports. Thank you for your leadership and for working to make our district a place where students and staff are provided the resources and supports needed to deliver a great public education to every student every day. Thank you. Thank you. Anna Whitney. Members of our school board, thank you for this opportunity to come before you tonight. I am Reverend Dr. Donna Whitney. I come before you representing the Education Task Force of NOAA, Nashville Organized for Action and Hope, a coalition of 67 member organizations, most of them faith-based organizations like my congregation, Metropolitan Interdenominational Church in North Nashville. I also come as the grateful mother, the very grateful mother of two daughters, now adults, who continue to benefit from the excellent educational experience they had at Metro Nashville Public Schools. And I come as a minister who tries to walk in faith with our young people when things are going well for them in school and when they experience the consequences, the devastating consequences of punitive discipline, punitive as opposed to restorative discipline in school. You see, it's not a newsflash that black and brown children comprise less than half of our Nashville public school population, but they comprise roughly three quarters of out of school suspensions. And this disparity between non-white and white student suspension has only been increasing in recent years. The consequences the devastating consequences of suspension, even one suspension, include not only academic failure, but also stoking of the school to prison pipeline with its own set of far reaching, devastating, and even deadly consequences for individuals, for families, and for communities. With this concern in my heart and mind, I'm asking this board not to implement proposed changes to the student handbook concerning discipline, particularly concerning suspension at this time. The current guidelines were established after deep consultation with parents and community organizations whose passionate concern is the education of our children and the safety and well-being of our children, teachers, and staff at school. If changes are made, let them be made thoughtfully. Let them be made in deep consultation with parents and communities, and let them be changes that actually enhance education, safety, and well-being 
rather than changes that simply appease for the moment while exacerbating racial disparities in suspension and actually doing nothing to enhance education, safety, and well-being at school for anyone. Let the changes we make be changes that create a uniform approach to school discipline district-wide. Let the changes we make include care centers and restorative justice practices that truly enhance learning, safety, and school culture. Thank you. Thank you. Phyllis Sells, no Phyllis Sells, Mary Graham, oh, okay. Thank you, Dr. Battle and the uh, school board members for allowing me to uh, speak today. My name is Phyllis Sells and I'm a member of NOAA, Nashville Organized for Action and Hope also a 30-year retired Metro school social worker. So I have great respect for the school system. And I really must say that I was pleased to see that Pearl Cone um, and Park, no, well, Pearl Cone and Buena Vista were serving meals in North Nashville. That was wonderful. And I went to volunteer at, um, Park Avenue to help the transition of the Robert Churchwell, and they by noon they had everything all fixed on Saturday. So done a good job. Uh, I just want to reiterate what um, uh, Ms. Donna said, um, but I want to also remind us that last year at this time during budget session, uh, monies were put in place for fund fully funding more programs such as SEL, restorative practices, and advocacy centers uh, in individual schools to support teachers in response to the policy to decrease and end suspensions and expulsions in elementary schools. We cannot suspend and expel little babies. That's just not right. But teachers need support and services available when troubled children become so disruptive that they cannot stay in the classroom. So when the school budget last year was cut, monies for these support services were also cut, leading teachers to abide by a policy without the services needed to carry it out. We are aware that modifications of the suspension and expulsion policy may be put in place for the remainder of this school year because of the adverse effect this policy without supports is having uh, in, on teacher morale and the ability to teach effectively. This change, if it happens, must be carefully carried out. It is worrisome that an increase in suspensions and expulsions will adversely affect those troubled children and their families. And as we know, too often our children of color are the ones that are suspended and expelled. Mm -hmm. This change of policy may mean that um, children will go home to very, uh, very environments that contributed to their trauma and parents will need to stay home from jobs to provide supervision. And when children are not in school, they are not learning. It is certainly imperative that if monies are secure, are secured in the 2021 budget for more support services, training for teachers, that the original policy of no suspensions or expulsions would be put in place. And NOAA will certainly support a fully funded school budget. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Dr. Battle and members of the board. Uh, my name is Mary Jo Cram. I'm a Metro teacher and parent. I was able to attend one of Dr. Battle's presentation on the budget a couple weeks ago. She did a great job emphasizing how far the city has fallen short of fully funding the MNPS budget for the past four years for a cumulative $112 million shortfall. I hope that this year's budget request, the board will ask the city to make up for every dollar of that funding shortfall with interest. Because when funding requests get denied, those unmet needs don't just go away, they grow. And it becomes even more expensive to fix problems that have grown worse by years of neglect. Much more expensive than it would have been if we'd had the funding to proactively address these problems years ago. I agree with most of the priorities this board has made for the budget, but I disagree with the way that maintenance of effort is defined. 
Most importantly, step increases for teachers are not included in the maintenance of effort budget. If teachers don't get step increases this, in this budget, that means that next year, a 10-year teacher will make less money than a 10-year teacher made this year. That's effectively a pay cut. That means the city's effort in funding is decreasing, not maintaining constant. This budget has defined maintenance of effort in a way that makes it step increases seem optional or nice to have, rather than essential and non-negotiable, just like the increase in the water bill. I know compensation is the number one stated priority of this budget, and I believe that step increases may have been left out of the maintenance of effort budget strategically because there's a hope to totally revamp the salary schedule. And I share those hopes we, because we do need a totally new salary schedule, mostly because the cumulative effects of multiple misstep increases over the last 10 to 15 years. But I worry that by leaving step increases out of the maintenance of effort budget th in these presentations, there's been a missed opportunity to educate the public about what step increases mean to teachers and why they cannot be seen as optional. Denying step increases tells teachers that their experience is worthless and that their loyalty and skill do not matter. It's an incredibly demoralizing message to get from this district year after year. Teachers will only support a budget that includes step increases and a large cost of living adjustment, or better yet, a brand new salary schedule like the one proposed by the district's compensation committee in October, which MNEA has voted to support. We will advocate with city council and the mayor for MNPS budget that truly prioritizes teacher and staff compensation. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah Duran, is Sarah here? Yeah, okay. You. Uh, good evening. My name is Sarah Duran, and I'm a middle school um, English teacher at Thurgood Marshall Middle. Um, I just wanted to um, iterate something that has stuck with me for the last couple of weeks. Um, I attended a council budget meeting at which um, Mrs. Player Peters was there also. And um, in discussing the budget, one of the words that she used was that the budget proposal that we were looking at was one in which we would be maintaining status quo. Um, and I also was lucky enough to be here, here the night before in which we received the report from HR about um, the vacancies that we had in the school system. So status quo means that we have 160 vacancies just for certified teachers, over 240 um, other vacancies. We have classes with no teachers. We have, you already have all those numbers. Um, for me, one thing that is, has never been a part of status quo <clears throat> is that as soon as February came around this year, this is my first year in Metro, and um, I was asked no fewer than probably 20 times by colleagues, by students even, um, are you coming back? And while my answer was yes, I was taken aback by that question um, because the majority of the people that I asked back said no and a majority of them are not coming back to teaching whatsoever. So just like we as teachers, as MNEA, the community are putting pressure on you, um, we would like to ask for you to make sure that you're putting that pressure on the council as well because status quo is just not gonna be good enough for us. Okay, thank you. Hello, my name is Amanda Baker. I'm a kindergarten teacher. Um, this is my 11th year teaching. First, I wanted to say thank you all, Dr. Battle of the District and MNEA for taking swift, swift action last week during one of the most challenging times in our lives. We showed that we can all come together and work for a common cause. We together gave hope, peace, and restored dignity to people that had otherwise lost it. And just as the struggles that our city faces from the mass devastation caused by this tornado, the struggle to restore dignity in our classroom continues on. Today, I stand before you and ask you to form a united front with us. The students, the parents, the teachers, the support staff, and MNEA to fight for a moral budget. 
This is not a budget of maintaining status quo. Let me please remind you about our status quo. Maintaining status quo means 160 classrooms without certified teachers every single day. It means over 100 support staff vacancies. It means over a thousand children possibly without reliable, consistent transportation to and from school, my children included. And thousands of children and students, children and teachers without proper SEL support or sufficient classroom curriculum or materials. At this point, status quo will not suffice. Status quo means these numbers are acceptable. As an MNP, MNPS teacher and parent, I am highly discouraged and disappointed that status quo is our worth. I should not have to contemplate selling my home and moving to another district to be able to earn a livable wage. Status quo does not provide dignity in our classrooms. It is my understanding that we are waiting for a compensation study to be concluded for the mayor. But let me also remind you that our time in budget season is slowly ticking away. Could it be possible that this conclusion is being prolonged so that there is no pushback in a budget that can be passed upon maintaining status, so that a budget is passed based upon maintaining status quo? You are our advocates and our voice. If you can't speak and fight for us, who will? You are our elected board that serves to be our voice of reason. Will you choose to silence us and our students' needs to maintain status quo, or will you stand up and fight for us to bring dignity back to our classrooms? Great. Thank you. Andrew Wecker. Andrew? Oh, you already, okay. Uh, Lynn Hoyt. Hello, board and Dr. Battle. My name is Lynn Hoyt and I live in District 9. I'm an NPS parent. I represent Tennessee Arrows and I have the honor of serving on the Alignment A team for Community Achieves. I'm here to speak to you on the adoption of Community Achieves in the Community Schools Model Resolution to be presented to the board this evening by my school board rep, Amy Frog. Community Achieves and the way we do community schools in Nashville is unique. But the idea of a community school is not new. The Tennessee Community School State Network, where I serve also as co-coordinator, currently identifies 127 schools across Tennessee, employing a full-time site manager to align services and supports for students. You might ask, what is a community school? Well, first of all, we must understand that I'm talking about a strategy as much as a place. And it is based on a national model. The mission statement of Community Achieves is to design full-service community schools through a framework that is strategically aligned to resources to foster student success. The results-focused partnership between parents, the community, and schools will personalize learning for students and lead to stronger families and healthier communities. But how do they do that, and why does this matter? I could not think of a better illustration than the unthinkable disaster that this city experienced last week. In the chaos of tornado relief, there was an organized MMPS machine at work led by the institutional knowledge of Dr. Battle, who knew who to call and where to turn. Our school-based coordinators with Community Achieves, Communities in Schools, and our Family Resource Centers were central to bringing their partners, teachers, students, and parents together to connect to resources, not only for the schools, but the neighborhoods they serve. Shout out to Pearl Cohn on that one. But if you don't start, but you don't start a community school at that point, it is work to communicate and it's not perfect. We must be committed to funding coordinators, give time to relationships, time that is hard to find. Principals and teachers need to be brought in completely and open to cooperation from the outside. And it can be messy when building trust and involving students and families. Example, tornado hit school causing relocation, consolidations and upset families. One email last night connected Jerry Baxter and Graymar schools coordinators to the Meg's PTO. Now the PTO will be feeding the staff all week and engaging coordinators to better understand how to support positive healing during a difficult transition so principals and teachers can focus on instruction. 
This is not about charity, it's about strategy, to see families and youth be able to equitably lead the positive, healthy changes in schools they deserve. When people learn to work together for success, a community can rise to address any challenge. This resolution is a shared vision of understanding to include transformational community schools thinking and all our schools improvement planning to optimize the conditions for learning. I hope you will vote yes on this resolution. Thank you for your support. Thank you. We have finished our um, public participation portion of our meeting. We will move on to governance issues with the consent agenda. I will entertain a motion to uh, approve and second. I would like to pull something from the consent agenda. Okay. Uh, e, the student handbook revisions. Anybody else? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Uh, number three, I want to pull Smith Springs and Thomas Edison for recommendation. That's not on consent. Oh, it's not It's not no. continuation. Yeah, it's just number one. Everything okay. under number one okay. is consent. All right. Sorry about that. Okay, that's fine. As you can tell, I want to do something. <laughs> okay. All right, student handbook revision is the only one that's being pulled. Okay, now I'll entertain a motion to approve the amended consent agenda. I will move to approve the amended consent agenda. Okay. Ms. Bogue, uh, motion, a second? Second. Okay. All in favor, please show of hands. Unanimous. Okay, it's unanimous. All right, uh, Ms. Bugs. Thank you. So we've heard a lot about the discipline policy and the handbook changes, and this was one that, this was a discipline change that I kind of carried when Noah, Passage, and some other community members came to me, and um, they brought students, they brought young students, they brought um, adult student or adult former students to talk about their experience in the school to prison pipeline, what it felt like at five and six to be suspended or expelled, what it felt like at nine to be arrested. So this was just really close to me, and I've been torn because especially after talking to Dr. Battle and seeing the good work that she's doing and seeing the way she's been so responsive and proactive and reacting appropriately to parent, teacher, and student concerns. But I've been torn because I see both sides of this story. I see teachers who are asking for more resources, who are asking for ways to better support their students who have, high, who have more needs, but then I also see students. And I can't help but be selfish and know that I do have a black boy. And however you feel about that, the reality is that there are disparities that are hitting my son against uh, success, that um, in the grand scheme of things with him being zoned to a true community school, a neighborhood school, Buena Vista, that serves the neediest students in our school district, um, that is just, again, it's just resonating with me and it's sitting with me and I've, I've talked through this with a few different people. Of course, I've talked with Dr. Battle about it. Um, but more than anything, this is a call for resources. And this is the same thing that I told that task force last year, that I appreciate when anyone comes to advocate to the school board. But I really, really, really cannot press upon you enough the idea that you need to be advocating to the mayor and council. Many times, you are, you're preaching to the choir. Uh, many of, well, at least some of us were former teachers. So we know what it feels like. We are rooting for you. I was one of those teachers that left because of culture and underpayment and I am an MNPS product and, and I was an MNPS teacher, so I feel you. Um, but at the same time, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm tired of the city, I'm tired of Nashville and Tennessee making us pit neighborhood against neighborhood, person against person. And this conversation has been very much a teacher versus student conversation. It's been a resourced family versus under-resourced family conversation because when we originally had the conversation, because we were only focusing on elementary schools, when we originally had the conversation, I didn't expect to get any pushback. I felt that the community would rally behind this. It makes sense. Don't suspend, expel, or arrest elementary school kids unless it's one of the most egregious expense, uh, uh, offenses. We even talked about making sure that if a student threatened or harmed a teacher, that that would still count as something that was suspendable, that that, that, that student could be um, removed from a classroom or removed from that setting. But I still got pushback. You had parents who said, well, what about my student? If my student is being impacted by this other kid, why can't they just be put out? And so I'm, A, asking the community to just consider seeing this through a different lens and making sure that we are seeing students as people and that we're seeing families as people even when they don't speak for themselves. You have to remember that there are disenfranchised community members, disenfranchised parents who didn't have a good experience in our school system or in a school system period so they don't know what it looks like to advocate so when their child is suspended and it's something that's not suspendable based on our handbook they don't even know that they can speak up so 
I represent a very diverse district. I have very, very affluent community members, and I have very disenfranchised ones, very uh, poor ones who live literally way below the poverty line. And the, I could never come to the board floor and say, I have X number of emails from disenfranchised families who want to push back against something. That's just not the way advocacy typically works. You look for another advocate to help a disenfranchised family. So I, I don't want to pontificate. That's not my goal. But I really do want us to look at all sides of this conversation and be thinking about how we'll move forward in the future. I mean, I, I understand what the task force and those people who spent hours, I mean, I remember that one day where they were here for about 10 hours. I understand and appreciate what they're saying and that they're pushing on us to be mindful because right now, 40, better yet in the fall, 45% of the elementary school suspensions were non-suspendable. 45% of the students ages three through nine who were suspended in the fall of this semester were suspended for non-suspendable offenses. Now, please understand, that makes an argument on both sides that says that even the policy that we had in place was not quite doing what we wanted it to do. There were still disparities, even with the shift. That also says, though, that we have teachers that are crying out for something else, some other type of support. So um, I really wanted to hear what my colleagues had to say. I appreciated hearing from Dr. Bell. You know, I called her um, and was able to hear from her and hear all the different stakeholders and stakeholder types that she had interacted with to make sure she was really being thoughtful about this. But I do kind of want to just open this up for discussion so that we can um, make sure that the community understands where we stand. And so, to be honest, so we know where we stand. Anybody want to Thank respond? you for coming to my TED Talk. Ms. <laughs> Bush? So I have prayed and I have prayed on how I'm going to address this issue. So here we, here we are. I am a mother of five black boys, the brown and black boys that we're talking about. And I am uh, in support of uh, support in these revisions, and I'm going to tell you why. We have teachers that are suffering every day because of discipline. The discipline has gotten completely out of control. I talk to students, I talk to teachers, I talk to counselors. I do my due diligence to make sure that before I speak, I research. And I'm able to ask real people about real problems. And we have got to get a handle on our discipline policy, or we're going to continue to drive up not only 160 of, of certificated teachers that are vacant, we're going to drive up more. So Passage and NOAA, the same documentation that's written for us, needs to be written for the parents. We're going to have to start holding our parents accountable. And that is it. We're not Put, we're not holding our parents accountable. We're not becoming more of a community engagement on, on holding parents responsible. I'm being held responsible every day for my boys. I have three in college, one at Junior Hillsborough, one at over at Oliver, and this is becoming out of control with discipline. Teachers are not coming back. We're nervous about this semester because this is a semester that teachers do make decisions on if they want to continue with us or not, based on all the information or based on all the problems that they've dealt with or all the, you know, dealing with our budget, you know, pay and all that good stuff. But the last thing they need is to be bombarded or be put in a situation and in the trenches every day when they're trying to teach and discipline has gotten so out of control. Talk about our elementary, our middle, and now our high school students. In order for us to get a handle on discipline, we have to do something that's going to be more egregious. And it has to get the attention of parents. I am a parent. I can speak it, I can live it, and I can say it. I know what's happening in the schools. My students come home and tell me. My junior right now, I've talked to students and they hate their school. They're ready to graduate because they cannot, they're being left behind. Those are the good students that are saying, my teacher can't teach because she's spending more time disciplining other children and we're tired of it. We're the ones being left behind and it's not fair and it's not fair. And we have got to get a handle on our discipline policy and we have to hold our parents more accountable. I'm held accountable. So when my students are getting out of control, my black and brown boys, it is my responsibility to make sure that I bring them back and redirect them, not the teacher's responsibility, and we need to stop now. What has been revised in this, um, this handbook is needed. 
So the same information that we wanna put on the schools, we need to put into the parents' lab. And that's where the answer is. And that's what we keep missing. It is the responsibility of the parents. Now, we do have students that do need that extra support, and I'm not saying that. We definitely need support to support our students who have um, some mental support that we need. You know, we have our IEPs that are in place. Um, you know, we have things that we can do to support our students. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying blatant out, being disrespectful, coming to school every single day to be disruptive and taking the education from those students who want to be there, who wants to learn, it's not right, it's not fair, and we have got to change it. And we have to put it out in the atmosphere that MMPS is not going to tolerate it no more. We have got to get back to some type of sound mind of education and, 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 and being disruptive every day is not excusable. And we have got to get more handle on it and we need to pass this, we need to vote on it because we're gonna have to do something more to support our teachers because right now we're losing because of discipline, because of discipline. I get what you're saying, I understand the passion, but I also understand the passion of those students who are being left behind who are saying that they're tired, they're tired. So when this was passed last year, no support. We gave them no support. We didn't have it in the budget, but we were sure happy and excited and cheerleading around about this, but we gave them no support. So now where are we? <clears throat> we, ha we have a serious problem on our hand with discipline. You walk those high schools, you walk those middle schools, and you walk those elementary school uh, students also. And it's not fair for students to come back in the classroom after they just destroyed their classroom and, and being disrespectful, those and interrupting the classroom and have no place to go but back in the classroom. And what does it do to the teachers emotionally, mentally, and physically? What does it do for them? So that's what we're, where we are, and that's what we have to look at because I get it. I've raised five black boys in this district and I'm still raising them. So I understand and I get it. We don't want this saying a prison, a pipeline. No, oh, my boys ain't going to prison. They ain't going to jail. You know why? Because I'm a parent and I take the responsibility on what happens to those boys. And I'm gonna make sure I hold them accountable. It's not for the teachers to raise our kids. It's for them to teach. Anybody else? So I think she brought up a lot of good, sen or a lot of sentiments that are floating into the community. Again, my goal is to ask you all to just shift your thinking because we talk about discipline without really focusing, without saying and without saying students, like these are people, like yes, people can cause disciplinary issues, people, students, little people whose brains have not fully developed yet, yes, they sometimes have behavior issues, and I do think that there is a layer of parent involvement and parent engagement that we have to ratchet up, but, just because we can advocate as parents. Every child doesn't have that, you know. No child chooses to come home and be a disruption. I mean, come to school and be a disruption, but sometimes they are, which is why I'm saying I'm torn. I see both sides and I just want us in the community to be using language that humanizes these people, these students, these children, and that humanizes teachers as well, that reminds us that all that, Teachers and students come to school with issues. Teachers and students came back to yesterday after having been traumatized from a tornado. Does that mean that they need to be suspended or expelled? Sometimes based on the discipline matrix, yes, but sometimes no. And I mean, that is for us to advocate for more resources, but I just don't think it's, it, I don't think this is an easy conversation. It's certainly not an easy decision. Um, like I said, when we, when we talk about holding parents accountable, again, what does that do about the child? Like, uh, children can't choose their parents. Sometimes parents are not always there. Parents have other issues. I mean, we just, you could talk about this for forever. Um, and I just don't like the idea of saying good students and kind of pulling them away from other students that we don't deem good. Like, they're still kids. I mean, so I taught in middle school. In middle school, right when everybody started getting cell phones and they were sending things to one another, and it was on me and the parents to work together. 
but it was not an easy conversation to have. Bullying is at an all-time high in, in MNPS, in Nashville, in America with cell phones. Again, that is for us to partner on. And so I just really think, I just, again, I more than anything want us to just have the conversation. Like I said, I've been torn. I um, want to continue to, to try to help advocate, but I've got to push out into the community as we are advocating to the council and mayor. I really ask for you all to do the same. The same speeches you all present to us, that same passion, take that to them. We, if I, if I had the money, I'd give everybody a 20% raise. I give it to myself too, but that's neither here nor there. I just really, I mean, and, and I mean, I'm making light of this, but really, I, I just, I, I can't just press on you just how much this has been a, a tough decision for me. I am ready to, to support it because I do believe in supporting a director who um, is well known, well understood in the district, who I know will circle back to every stakeholder group. So I feel comfortable and confident in her leadership. So I'm ready to pass this, but I do want the community to just keep all these things in mind. Ms. Pooker Walker. I just want to say that as a former teacher, um, you know, the discipline disparities that we see in our district are not um, accidental, right? That there is a long, multi-decade um, system of it, and the students will tell you this, um, different rules for different situations for different kids. That is just a fact. Um, there is a, a thing called implicit bias. Every single person in this country has their bias. I have my own bias, right? And so we have to examine that, right? And I also think that we have to be careful um, to, to, to bl cast blame in any one place. I don't believe parents are the problem, teachers are the problem, kids are the problem. It is a collective responsibility that we have to prepare students to succeed. And so when we have students that are um, creating disruption in the classroom, hurting other students, hurting teachers, um, whatever, whatever the case might be, um, it is a symptom of a larger problem. And so I think it is on us to examine, are we doing everything we possibly can for those students? Is it, are we really putting systems in place? And it's true, we have not provided what, what teachers have needed. But we also haven't provided what students need, right? And so um, I believe that this is not, there's no easy fix. It doesn't exist. Um, that's why we've prioritized SEL on this uh, budget season, right? Because we know that teachers need much more support. Um, parents need more support. Um, and so I think we have to be careful to remember that these are children, that we are all um, at times guilty of making assumptions about people in our own community. Um, and, and so we just have to check sometimes ourselves on um, larger sort of assumptions. And I'll, I'm including myself there. Um, and so I support Dr. Battle and her, her attempts to support and make the tough decision, the tough call. Um, that's the hardest position to be in because you know you're going to get um, people that are going to be upset with you either way. Right? And so I do believe she's trying to find an answer that um, will work for our schools. And in the meantime, we'll fight for supports for our students and our, and our teachers to the best of our ability. Great play. Um, I think when it comes to the issue of discipline, it's not also an easy answer. I think it's something as we manage the system, there's macro and micro aspects to it. Um, and when we're talking about disparities between black and brown boys um, and other students, that it goes back to resources, it goes back to training, goes back to intent, um, and how it can't be fixed overnight. And I agree with Ms. Bugs that um, we all want to do the right thing. It's all a holistic approach. It's, multi, it's, it's a multi-prong approach um, and that we have to find the system. And I do agree, we all want to fix it. It's gonna take time. We may make mistakes, we may not. We have to adjust, but this is the difficulty of managing, as I say, a billion dollar system, 80,000 kids, 10,000 employees. And then we have principals have ability to manage their own school, give them enough autonomy for them to lead, um, but also provide oversight and culture and leadership in that. And this is, and it's one of the things when you're managing a school system, you're also, we're a mayor of the system that we are in, in the society and the government system that we're in. If you talk to the sheriff's department, if you talk to the police department, the word, how do you police youth? How do you guide youth? 
And I think, and we feel it first because we are the real life imitation of what's going on in society through our children. And um, I agree with Ms. Bugs is the conversation is not a one-time conversation. The handbook's not gonna be fixed overnight. We're gonna be constantly updating. I'm pretty sure this is not gonna be the first amendment that we're gonna have. Um, and the hard part as Nashville grows, as our school system grows, how do we ask for grace and patience of how do we try to fine tune and fix to get to a good part? NOAA, I've been a member of NOAA, been a part of NOAA, understand the good work and the community aspect that comes into it, and the fact that we have community willing to spend hours to study that, we're grateful of that, um, but then also making sure parents have the resources. You know, we have parents from all different ages, all different backgrounds, all different types of experience, trying to do the best they can, working two or three jobs, or maybe having adverse trauma. Teachers have to, are expected to be social workers when they're not necessarily, that's not their job description, but that's the indirect role that they play, and they have to play parent, auntie, uncle, all those roles at the same time. Um, and so, so it's a conversation that we have to keep having, and we have to work through how we talk about it. Sometimes it'll be graceful, sometimes it's not gonna be graceful, but hopefully everyone understands the intent. You know, this is one of the things we have to go to the council, have to go to the mayor, saying this has to be resources to be done, because it's, it first starts in school. If somehow we have to find a way to start figuring out that process so we don't feel it when they become of age and we see it on the back end and hopefully the sheriff or the police department doesn't have to go that far. But as the city continues to have these conversations as we had in the past about race, equity, inclusion, we are now as a society starting to have these conversations and we're gonna do it sometimes with grace, sometimes with not, and we have to be focused on it. And I think that's my intent here. How do we have those conversations? How do we do it appropriately? How do we use the right best, best practices that we've learned internally and externally throughout the nation? We're not you know, mutually exclusive here in Nashville. This has been going across the country. And so um, we understand where the teachers are. They're exasperated. We hear you. We understand that. And we're trying to figure out what's the most effective way we can do it. We're scalable over 162, 162 62 schools, so I can get it out. So, um, you know, I'm not a parent, but I've been in the community and heard this conversation for years. It's not a new conversation, but it's one of those things we have to be very intentional. And I think that's our goal as a board. When we have our retreats, as we said, it's part of our board priorities, um, our budget priorities, to have these conversations. And we can't have them here. We have to take them outside of this. That's one of the things I plan to advocate when I talk to my council members, when I talk to them, these are one of the reasons why SEL is one of the top priorities, because how we have that culture of school inside and that culture of community, it's gonna go outside when we hear about kids breaking into cars. And that's the biggest rate of crime that's going up in our school, in our community. And that, how do we start addressing that? And schools is one aspect of it. It's not the aspect. And I expect us to be the aspect of it, but it's part of it. And how it, it, it spills over. And so that's part of the conversation we have. Like, how can, what can we do as a system? What can we do as a district? How do we give principals and teachers what they need on the school level? What can we do on the level? And I think it's a constant conversation that's not gonna be answered overnight, but I think small tweaks work. If not, if it doesn't work, we go back to the drawing table and start again. But um, I think it's something we need to have that conversation, start setting the parameters, going to the foundation of as we, as a society, as a culture, as a city, as a county, as a state, as a school system, have these conversations. We're very thoughtful and mindful who they affect, being honest about who they affect on all sides of it, and make sure that um, we try and give the resources they need and then hearing the feedback from the community. When the teacher said it doesn't work, we go back to the drawing table and find something that doesn't, when it doesn't work for principals, we go back. When we as system, I've gotten calls from parents about bullying, that's part of the aspect of the discipline system. But also, kids are kids. You know, if you spend any time with kids, they're gonna have good days, they're gonna have bad days, and how do we address that? And it's hard in the system. And, um, and how do you train that? And training is also part of it that when you talk about implicit bias, it's a constant training and being intentful. So um, I think as a conversation we continue to have, I think the revisions is just one step in the long journey. And we just have to continue to do this. Like we have retreats, continue to talk about this, have town hall meetings with the teachers and the support staff and figure out how are we tweeting this, what cost that we can do and how do we pay for that and what does it cost? 
and how can we address that? Um, so hopefully this will just be the first of many conversations, first of many revisions. If we have to do it piecemeal, we will. But understand too, we have to scale this up to 162 schools. Might work one school, might not, but give that enough freedom and autonomy, but also enough oversight and leadership. And that's where we struggle, I think, of how to do that correctly. And so um, that's my two cents in it. I feel like I kind of pontificated <laughs> for a while, but I just want to give my input on that. Um, so I'm going to piggyback a little bit on my colleague, Ms. Bush, and, and several other colleagues in that um, I get, um, there doesn't, there's not a week that goes by that I don't get e an email from a teacher telling me how frustrated he or she is because they feel like they are a glorified babysitter instead of a teacher and they're having to, you know, revamp their classroom because of one or two students who want to, you know, create a ruckus as opposed to learning. It's clear to me that what we're doing now is not working. So yes, we probably do have many revisions. We have to start somewhere. Um, when Dr. Battle, you know, called me about this this first revision here, I, w I am supportive of her because we have to um, provide supports for our teachers in, um, in, in their classrooms. And I do remember when we passed this initially, that was my biggest complaint at the time was that we didn't have supports in the classroom for our teachers. We were basically putting them out there with no armor, with no tools, but with nothing, you know, and we have got to do a better job in um, allowing our teachers to do what they were hired to do, and that's teach my child. I have one, I had one email from a high school teacher who said that one of her students had over 100 citations. As a parent, if I didn't find out that my student um, had that many citations until he or she had over 100, I would be most upset because I want to know after the first one. You know, as my colleagues have said, we have got to enlist the parents' help in this. Ultimately, they are responsible, and I want to make sure I know if my children are not, you know, acting appropriately at school so I can take the measures needed to make sure he or she does act appropriately and, and he or she is not the cause for that classroom disruption. So I think this is a it's a great first step, Dr. Battle, and um, I will be supportive of this policy change. I'm sorry, Ms. Elrod. <coughs> Thank you. So I think the data is pretty clear of that there's a discrepancy among the uh, children that are suspended, and that is the reason why we are having this conversation. Um, it is not only just our black and brown young men, but also our children that are um, within our special or exceptional ed situations as well, um, and not those children that are, quote, needing mental support. Um, so I want to make sure that we're clear about that. First of all, um, we also need to be aware that we did not we did not support you. We need to honor the work that was done, not only by NOAA and other groups, but also that our teachers and students. Um, and so we should have done a better job at giving you funding for that. And we're really trying to advocate for that this year. Um, but we need to do something now while we can for all the reasons that are discussed. Um, and so I have a quick question. My question is, is if we do pass this, will this be reviewed by the discipline task force throughout the year to make sure this, this does what we want it to be done? And will we continue to monitor this progress or not progress that we're having with it? Um, yes, thank you for the question. So the, cur the current recommendations before you um, are to, if approved, would go in effect after spring break to give us time to communicate, um, translate, um, so that everyone is fully aware. We're also including a structure by which we will be monitoring um, our discipline um, incidents and level of responses through the remainder of the school year. We have tabled a number of codes um, that have been requested for upgrades and tweaks and changes um, that will go before the task force. So the task force um, we'll be reviewing our codes and our student handbook in its entirety um, as we plan for next school year. Um, so the codes that we're addressing today as well as all other codes and the book should be reviewed by the task force as we move forward. Okay. I would still encourage us to, of course, still look for that full uh, funding that we still need, whether we make this discipline change or not, we still need to do the, advocate, uh, the advocacy needed to better fund not only to, of course, honor the work that our teachers are doing, but also our students, um, and that it comes from a place of privilege to say, not I for my child or not I for me as a parent. And so we want to make sure that we still do that advocacy and that we still do that work. Thanks. Okay. 
Um, I think everybody's had their say. I would entertain a motion to go ahead and pass uh, item 1E on the consent agenda. I second. Who made the motion? Did you make a motion? Yeah, please. Ms. Bush. All right. I would like to uh, make a motion to uh, pass the um, student handbook revisions. Can I get a second? I'll second. Okay. Ms. Frog second. Can I get a, a vote by show of hands, please? All in favor? Okay. Everybody vote in favor. Thank you, everybody. It's a hot topic, can you tell? We will move on to item number two under governance issues. Ms. Froh. So I've been sitting here listening to this conversation, and I really believe that community schools are the answer to a lot of the issues that have been brought up today. Um, they help with student discipline. They help with teacher support social emotional learning they address the school to prison pipeline and so i think it's really important that we continue to expand our community schools program and that's why i brought the resolution tonight <clears throat> and i have a few remarks to, to uh, read before uh, i read the resolution since i first heard of community schools not long after i was first elected eight years ago i have been advocating for this model as a true solution I'm proud to say that I helped increase funding for community schools and MMPS several years ago, which drove the expansion of our Community Achieves program. Community schools address the root cause of low student achievement, the issues that our students face outside of school on a daily basis that impact their ability to focus in the classroom. In order for MNPS to reach its greatest potential, it's critical for us to continue to provide wraparound and support services that address students' basic and social-emotional needs. The following excerpt comes from a piece by Abel McDaniels called Building Community School Systems, Removing Barriers to Success in the U.S. Public Schools. It aptly summarizes the issues that we often face in urban school systems. Concentrated poverty exerts powerful constraints on access to opportunity and upward mobility. Neighborhoods of concentrated poverty, often defined as areas where at least 40% of residents are low income, contend with high rates of unemployment, population turnover, and housing instability. In the aftermath of the recent recession and amid rising income inequality, more Americans and more American children live in areas of concentrated poverty. The number of high poverty census tracts has increased 50%, since 2000, and 11 million people live in census tracts where at least 40% of their neighbors are low income. Concentrated poverty fuels racial inequality in the United States as blacks and Latinos are more likely to live in neighborhoods of concentrated poverty than white people. Working in the isolation, schools cannot overcome the effects of concentrated poverty. One study examined the math test scores of 10 million middle school students by census tract. It found that as poverty levels in a school's neighborhood increased, student achievement decreased from an average score of 0.4 in schools with the lowest poverty levels to an average score of negative 0.2 in schools with the highest poverty levels. And the impact of concentrated poverty on student achievement compounds over time. Growing up in a high poverty neighborhood has been shown to reduce the probability of graduating high school, and moving to a lower poverty neighborhood has been shown to, I'm sorry, mo yeah, moving to a lower poverty neighborhood has been shown to increase a child's future earnings by 4% per year. By no means are these effects the fault of people living in low-income neighborhoods, nor are they the faults of educators who staff the neighborhood schools. Other challenges facing these neighborhoods, such as high rates of unemployment, rapid population turnover, and changes in the job market, exacerbate the effects of poverty. When neighborhood disadvantage is concentrated in this way, it weakens community institutions. Historically, policies at all level, levels of government have helped create neighborhoods of concentrated poverty, and they too often facilitate disinvestment in these communities. A 2017 analysis from the Center for American Progress suggests that roughly 10 million children currently extend, attend extremely high poverty K through 12 schools in which three, are, uh, three out of four of their classmates are low income. The increase in poverty found in other research suggests that even more students attend schools affected by concentrated poverty. 
To improve the quality of education for low-income children in consistently low-performing schools, policymakers have raised academic standards, focused on teacher quality, increased instructional hours, and experimented with new models of school governance. While these efforts have brought improvements to some states and school districts, no previous interventions have significantly improved outcomes for low-income children at scale. If the United States is ever to fulfill its promise of full equality for all citizens, its public schools need to work for all children. This article mentions new models of school governance that don't work, referring to charter schools. For over a decade, we have focused so much of our time and effort on charter schools in Tennessee, but charters on average do not perform any better than existing traditional schools. Charters often serve a different population than traditional schools, either intentionally or unintentionally. Because of this and because of the fiscal impact of charter expansion on school systems, charter schools have created greater systemic inequities and distract us from the work that we must do to truly uplift all of national students. As board members, we can endlessly debate school governance models, programming, budget, and curriculum. But until we, as a community and city, focus first on meeting children's basic needs and the services that will fill them, test scores and other outcomes won't miraculously improve. Nashville faces the challenge of serving about three quarters of students who are identified as low income. Our job is twofold. We must continue to provide good quality academic instruction and programming while also seeking to meet children where they are. This requires a deeper investment from our community, parents, and city. Community schools are the perfect vehicle to address student needs and to level the playing field for those students who come to school with the greatest challenges. This model also positively impacts teachers because their students are better supported and better prepared to learn. Community schools, when implemented with fidelity, have demonstrated great success. The Co Coalition for Community Schools defines community schools as a place and a set of partnerships between the school and other community resources. This model allows public schools to comprehensively address the holistic needs of a student population, especially those arising from poverty. The community schools approach is rooted in the belief that strong connections between the school system and local resources benefit all students, families, and communities. By developing strategic partnerships to align school and community resources, this strategy combines a strong instructional program with supports for families and youth development, as well as health and social services. Children's Aid, a New York City nonprofit organization that serves children and families in low-income neighbor, low neighborhoods says community schools are a strategy that delivers services tailor-made for a particular student population and positions those students to overcome the barriers to academic success. And before I read the um, resolution, I will just say that I saw the impact, like Lynn Hoyt mentioned, of community uh, schools in action this past week. We had just an immense outpouring of support from the schools in my district that were that were large, the, the efforts were largely led by our community schools uh, coordinators and uh, we were had a huge outreach to the North Nashville students and the families and communities that were impacted by the tornado. Those are the students that attend the schools in my district. And I do want to give a shout out to Maggie Dix, who's the H.G. Hill, H. Hill uh, Community School Site Coordinator, and Lynn Hoyt, who advocates for community schools, and also Allison MacArthur, who heads up our Community Achieves program, because there is really miraculous work being done through our community schools program, and we have the relationships in place to um, to drive success for a lot of our kids. Um, and so I will read the resolution and then I will be done. All right, a re resolution in support of Community Achieves, the community schools model in Metropolitan Nashville Public Schools. Whereas the Metropolitan Nashville Board of Education is, is responsible for managing all public schools established or that may be established under its jurisdiction, and whereas Metro Nashville Public Schools is committed to bringing the assets of the community, city agencies, and nonprofits to bear in the creation and support of Community Achieves, a community school initiative that builds partnerships to expand opportunities and lower, lower barriers to learning that impede academic achievement of our children, 
And whereas when coupled with a high quality core instructional program and parent, student, educator, and community voices, community schools are a vehicle for school transformation that can help close the persistent and destructive opportunity gaps in our schools and reverse growing in inequality in our society. And whereas the Metro Nashville Public Schools definition of a community school is, public schools that form partnerships with community organizations and use additional staff to meet the educational, physical, and emotional needs of students, families, and communities. Students and families are connected through community schools to a broad range of services, including food and clothing assistance, mental health treatment, academic enrichment, and adult education. Whereas this integrated, stra integrated strategy will lead to student success, strong families, and healthy communities. Whereas the design of each community school must scale over time and be tailored to the specific needs and assets of its children, families, and communities, every community school should include the following standards-based components. School leadership that is committed to the community school model, to seeing it as a strategy parallel to the school's instructional program, including the community school coordinator as integral to its leadership team, a school-based impact team led by the coordinator that includes parents, community partners, school staff, and youth in, stu in substantively and regularly advising the principal and school leadership team about all school matters that impact the well-being of the school's children, including but not limited to the school's programs and partnerships, the use of the school beyond uh, regular school hours, and implementing ways to increase family engagement. A full-time community schools coordinator who partners with the principal and serves as an essential member of the school's leadership team and whose role it is to develop, coordinate, integrate, and align programs and partnerships that serve students, families, and the community. Results-focused partnerships that are deeply invested in improving student outcomes and integrated into decision-making, coordination, and implementation of the community school strategy. A school improvement plan that explicitly outlines the roles of families, partners, and the community school coordinator to help achieve results and identifies and aligns a range of evidence-based programs and practices. A services, supports, and adv advocacy program informed by a cycle of improvement with comprehensive needs and assets assessment in the school and in the community. Outcomes, strategies, location of responsibility, and timelines regarding accomplishments shall be reflected in a peri periodically updated rolling strategic plan informed by the impact team and advised by the school improvement plan and key performance indicators. Outgoing professional development for school leadership, all staff, parents, and partners designed to educate on what a community school is and how it can improve the outcomes for the community school strategic plan that include a positive and supportive school climate, effective partnerships, and transformative parent and community engagement, dedicated space and calendar meetings in the school for the community school's coordinator, partners, and parents, systems accessible to the community school coordinator to collect, analyze, share, and respond to real-time data on student and school indicators such as attendance, achievement, and program participation, resource calendars, as well as workflows for scheduling, programming, and other essential fu functions that support student success. Evaluation of the community school strategy through a standards-based school review shall be part of the routine assessment of the school's effectiveness, effectiveness as a whole. Therefore, be it resolved, <laughs> sorry, the Metropolitan Nashville Board of Public Education rec recognizes the tremendous impact of Community Achieves and the many community partners who have worked with its staff to transform our schools and open new opportunities for thousands of children. I uh, will move to uh, approve this resolution as read. Second. Can I get a second? Second. Okay. Great discussion. I'd like to say something. Okay. I want to take a point of privilege to say that I um, am proud to say I was a community school coordinator at Glencliff High School with Allison and with Adrian and with lots of other great folks. And it is really um, some of the most important work that I've ever done. And I'm so proud of <laughs> Allison MacArthur. And I want her whole team and all the coordinators to stand up and be recognized for all their great work. thinking about 
you know, our students and their needs and, um, and our families and truly are creating uh, schools that are the sort of the hub of their community and I couldn't be prouder of the work that y'all are doing. Anybody else? Yes. Um, after I got appointed, one of my first interaction was community schools over at Woodsit Elementary and helping them put on a, um, a holiday shop so parents can come and buy clothes and toys and stuff for kids again, uh, people in the community to donate, and it was a really a wonderful sight to see, to see the kids come on Friday afternoon and try to set it up and everything, and people come and buy things and have gift wrapped and like things like that to make something like something as simple as a holiday feel more warm and welcome. Um, that was one of, one of the first introductions as being a board member, and so uh, to see the wonderful effect they have in meeting the other community partners, the churches that was less than a quarter of a mile on the other side, what's in the back side, helping in, and local businesses coming in, and it was, it was a wonderful warm feeling. It felt like a little neighborhood kind of block party that happened and showed that um, the good things that schools can do and that people in the community um, who were grandparents love to come in and help and young parents coming in, seeing the generations just coming together and just wrapping around um, their arms around the school was a great and warm feeling that this is the community that we kind of grew up with, that when you think of schools, this is what you kind of think of. And um, so um, I'm glad that you brought this resolution and just to acknowledge the people. I know um, Chris was here, but he probably stepped out, probably pick up his son. Um, and so, and, and Chris was a great, warm, welcoming person um, to me and welcoming to the first meeting that they had. So um, I agree wholeheartedly that they're a crucial part of the school and for us to wrap their arms around um, the schools and help them in all different types of need is an important role that they play. I just want to apologize for not acknowledging all of you. I didn't recognize that all of you were community schools um, coordinators and really appreciate your work. What you're doing is so important for our kids, so thank you for being here tonight. Anybody else? Okay, we have a motion that's been properly uh, made and seconded. Any, uh, we've had discussion. Can I get a, a vote on the motion for community and schools? All in favor? Anyone opposed? Thank you. We'll move on to our uh, number three, Metro Schools Reimagined. Ed, um, Dr. Battle. Let me get a picture. Oh, you all want a picture? Okay, sure. Go for it, Ed. If we could do a real quick picture. Part of community schools is voice, and as a system, we get voice from our alignment Nashville community chiefs team, and we actually have some of those members here tonight. I would love for them to join us if they're still here. I want Dr. Antoinette Williams. We are part of support services. A lot of people think we're a nonprofit. Okay. We are part of MMPS, part of support services. I want Dr. Antoinette Williams to join us. Is Tom Ward still here? Even Lynn? I want Lynn to join us, and Michelle. Michelle is on our team also. It's important to get voice from all stakeholders. Okay, you don't have anything oh, on that. I don't. Okay. Right. No, that's okay. That's fine. Thank you, Ms. Fogg, for bringing that resolution tonight. Um, we'll move on to number four, which is the uh, amended director uh, search no. timeline. Dr. Severe? No, three. Number three. Um, Ms. Bush, did you have something on number oh, three? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Yes, um, on number three, um, I know it was packaged um, as far as the transitional um, um, students that were going to be moving. I want to 
pull off Smith Springs and Thomas Edison, um, and I wanted to make a motion to uh, move that into uh, to the 24th meeting um, because we did have a meeting. A I always believe that we should always have a meeting with our families before these type of um, decisions are made to get their input. And we did have a meeting at Smith Springs Elementary regarding the transition of Thomas Edison students. I think we have 160, is that right, Dr. Bath? 150 students are going to be relocating from Edison to um, Smith Springs. And Frida and I attended the meeting last week. Um, it was a great meeting. We just did not have a, um, a, a good turnout from our Edison families. Um, it was uh, a little bit of a breakdown of communication um, from those families. And But tomorrow uh, we are going to do a Q&A for those families um, at Edison. Uh, they're going to have a musical. So it's going to be a more of a big turnout. Um, so that way we can kind of engage with those families and do a Q&A. So we'll start about 545 and we'll end at by 630. Okay, so you want this agenda item to be on the next meeting yes, on the 24th? Okay. Yes, please. Okay, now we will move on to number four, which is the amendment. Uh, I would just say it would probably be best to carve that out as a separate motion. Okay. And, right, and vote on it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. the point of parliamentary. Okay, um, so I would like to make a motion uh, to defer um, this item until March 24th. Okay, can I get a second on that? Second, quick question, do you want to, we just want to defer to Smith Springs. I think we're carving out one um, piece and gonna vote on the balance of the package, is my understanding. Do my friendly The Jerry Baxter. For Smith Springs and Thomas Edison. Right, this is what I'm doing, yeah. You think right. your, your motion is state So it would be two okay. motions then. Okay, so do you want me to just mention them? Okay, I know I mentioned it earlier, but do you want me to just put um, so I would, and Edison? I think the cleanest thing to do would be to, for Ms. Bush, if this is your desire, to make a motion to defer action on the Edison Smith Springs. Okay. And then let's take a vote on that. And then let's take a vote on the rest of the package. Um, gotcha. And that would be, that would be final action. Okay. All right, so I want to make a motion to defer the action of Thomas Edison and Smith Springs until March 24th. Did I, did I get A? Yes. Okay, awesome. Okay. Okay. Second. Okay. Okay. Can I get a second on Second. That? Okay, all right. Thanks. Do I have any discussion on that first motion that was made? Okay, all in favor, please show your hands. Okay. Ms. Bush, you want to make the second one? Sure, okay. It's, um, so on this one, this one's not mine, but you want me just to make a motion to approve? Mm -hmm. Okay, gotcha. All right, so I would like to make a motion to approve um, Jerry Baxter and Gray, Graymar Middle Schools transition is consolidation. Okay. Can I get a second? Second. Any discussion? I think it's worth, um, if you don't mind. Go ahead. I think it's worth noting that um, Dr. Battle and her team, I appreciate you all coming out in the middle of the tornado relief efforts last week to talk to Jerry Baxter and Graymar families. And let's be honest, you know, uh, Rachel Ann was there also. It wasn't an easy conversation to have, but you know, you all handled it very gracefully. I thank you for answering all their questions. And then you fast forward to Monday, or to yesterday, and it was a super smooth transition. I mean, when I went over there, there were no kids in the hallway. There was no you know, there was no chaos. I mean, they were even in the cafeteria, Graymar on one side, Jerry Baxter on the other, um, a lot of volunteers, a lot of community members, a lot of just teaching staff, upbeat and ready to support their kids. But um, I think we do need to be ready for tough conversations that come forward just about with those communities, making sure that they feel supported and they, that they don't feel marginalized yet again. This goes back to the disenfranchised community conversation. Um, but they they reacted well once Dr. Battle explained um, all the ways it would benefit their kids. Uh, when we talk about consolidation, the community needs to see that this is not us taking something away from the community, but this is us repurposing funding and resources that we have so much of. So um, <laughs> it just, it, I, I, I know that Jerry Baxter and Graymar families there were voicing the, the concern that they wanted to have this, this summer to transition. They wanted to be able to, I guess, vote or really talk about whether it would happen or not. But it was something that it was, it was the most feasible, most reasonable, even though it may not be the most comfortable for everybody. I like the way you said that. I, I fudged it up, but you, you, know, you know what you mean. <laughs> yes. Okay, anybody else have any comments? 
This is kind of as you make the recommendation, going to the growing pains of natural grows, and as we try to adjust as a district, um, again, it's going for just hopefully we'll provide leadership that's needed. We'll hear the voice. We do hear the concerns of the parents and especially the teachers and staff that it's an uncomfortable kind of transition that we're going to, but understand that we're here. We hear the need for resources. We want to advocate for those resources. Um, and that as we just try to work through these growing pains, you know, these recommendations have to come up as we adjust the system um, as the population shifts. So just want to know, as Fran and I attended the meeting, and I'm pretty sure that happened at Jerry Baxter, that we hear the, the teachers, we hear the parents, um, and as we just go through these growing pains as a city, more importantly as a city, that this is what's going on and that we, um, we are listening, we hear your support, and um, we'll continue to uh, make adjustments. Anybody else? All right, show of hands to um, approve this amendment as motion. Okay, unanimous vote, Ms. Bobo. All right, now we will move on to number four, amended direct to search timeline, Dr. Severe. Thank you, uh, <coughs> Chairman Shepard. Uh, as you all know, the candidate interviews were scheduled for last week. Uh, that would have been the second, second through, through the sixth. And obviously the, the timing was terrible and we were able to do essentially one and one half of the interviews with Dr. Richmond coming in and he got a, an expansive tour of the city uh, that morning, but he was not able because uh, had, for obvious reasons, Ms. Shepard was without power and, and we had uh, devastation across the, across the town. So we, we decided to defer that and uh, because we needed to refocus our efforts and redouble that work to get up and running for so we could have this smooth transition with, that we just discussed, it became apparent that we needed to kick the can down the road a little bit uh, and, and defer. In looking at schedules, um, everyone had sort of blocked off that week uh, for those interviews and that meant they put a lot of other things off that they needed to do to this week. So we couldn't just pick up that week and drop it down into this week. The next week being spring break, not only for uh, our students, but for many people in this room were not gonna be available uh, or had or otherwise committed and, and candidates had other commitments they couldn't change as well. So what we've done on the timeline is expand it from uh, March 2 to April 2, and that will be the window of interviews and they've already been set and they've already been calendared and I believe you have them. Uh, the next one will be on Thursday, it will be Dr. Battle. There'll be a four o'clock forum uh, for community members and in this room, there'll be a five o'clock forum for staff and faculty also in this room and then the six o'clock formal interview will occur at that point. Uh, after that, um, the, the date slipped me, but I believe uh, Ms. Shepard's gonna mention those in, in her closing remarks. Uh, but with that, uh, that meant that we needed to push the, um, the offer execute contract language down to the 14th of April, so that's where it resides, and we adjusted accordingly. And with that, I uh, accept a motion. Thank you, Dr. Sevier. And so, um, as he mentioned, we have Dr. Battle on Thursday with, at four, five, and six. Again, those meetings are always open to the public and um, hopefully they will be televised. And we will again have uh, comment cards for the people attending to complete. Um, or if you are unable to attend in person, please feel free to reach out to um, any board member or your board member to ask any questions or express any concerns that you might have with with any of the candidates uh, remaining. So um, after that, Dr. Richmond will be on Thursday, March the 26th. Brenda Elliott will be on Tuesday, March the 31st. And then um, Brian Kingsley will be on Thursday, April the 2nd. And it's really unfortunate that we have to spread them out this way, but you know, Mother Nature doesn't usually ask our opinions when she decides to, you know, create havoc, which is what happened in this case. So we're, you know, we we um, we came together as as quickly as we could to try and reschedule. Um, these interviews and you know we already had partnered with the Tennessee School Board Association I believe one person mentioned it tonight in public participation um, one of the reasons we did not use a national search firm for this search was because of the experience that she cited uh, most of them have a particular candidate or uh, who is their client that they want us to hire 
and uh, we fell victim to that. And we decided that, you know, shame on us because we fell victim to it more than once. So we were going to this time use the, T the Tennessee School Board Association who has a lot of experience in conducting director of school searches and they want to make, they want us to succeed. Uh, their offices are in the same city that w we are living in and they just, you know, we've been a member of TSBA for quite some time and they want us to be successful. They have, they, vetted 19 different candidates to come up with five for us to interview. And so that was a lot of work on their part because they had a team um, at their office that went through each and every resume. And last week while I was out without power, I went back over and read all the different resumes again um, because what do you do when you're without power? But anyway, so I went back and looked at all those resumes, and you know that's a lot of work on their part. So I, you know, I feel um, that we uh, need to honor the process and go ahead and um, complete the the, uh, the search as we had planned. Uh, well, the amended search timeline that we have uh, for the remaining uh, four candidates. So. Um, with that, I, um, I would entertain a motion to uh, adopt the amended um, search. Motion to um, accept the amended um, director uh, director search timeline. Okay, can I have a second? Second. Okay, it's been properly um, made and seconded. Can, do we have any um I have yeah. questions. Sure. So, um, Back in October, we had originally said that we were going to wait until January to do the search. We moved forward with the search early with the idea that we wanted to have someone in place for budget season. How does this impact us because it's no longer feasible? Well, and we mentioned that, and we also mentioned that we really wanted someone here um, to start for the beginning of the fiscal year, which of course is July 1, will more than meet that goal, but, um, you know, like I said, Mother Nature doesn't ask our opinion when trying to help us with the budget season. So um, in this particular case, we will have a decision um, on April the 14th, which is our first meeting in April. Um, I don't know what the amended budget season is. I do know it's been amended um, per request from the mayor's <coughs> office because he's having a meeting next Thursday, he's holding a, a press conference next Thursday to talk with us um, about that and about our budget. So um, hopefully we'll have all the information that we need prior to the when we have to make a decision on the director. So we're presenting the budget to the mayor on that date? Not, that's not my understanding. We're just having, a, um, he's holding like a presser just to release some information to us. Anybody else have any questions or comments? Oh, okay. So can I get a vote on a uh, show of hands on approving the amendment as, as presented? All in favor? Opposed? Okay, pass unanimously. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate that. Okay, we will go on to the director's report, Dr. Battle. Thank you and good evening board chair, vice chair and board members. The last week has offered up an amazing testimony to the strength of Metro Nashville Public Schools. The tornado may have ripped some holes in a few of our facilities, it may have knocked out power at many more, and it certainly affected some of our employees who have suffered painful losses in their homes, neighborhoods and families. But the storm couldn't lay a finger on the resilience of our individual school communities or our larger MPS family. That's why I have never been prouder to be a part of this school district than I've been over the last eight days. I've seen thousands of our employees jump into action across our city every day with only one thought in mind. What can I do to help and where am I needed most? I've seen teachers pack up their classrooms and then unpack them in new buildings, while principals, assistant principals, and other staff members, like our Community Achieves coordinators, providing supports to students and families, 
and coordinated the many logistical challenges of an unexpected move, all of it at incredible speed. All I've seen, and I've seen students and families adjusting with smiles on most of their faces to new facilities in new situations. The tornado damaged three of our buildings. Robert Churchwell Museum, Museum Magnet Elementary School has extensive damage to one wing of the building. It is in the heart of a community that was devastated by the damage. The structure is not sound and we will need to tear down this wing of the school. The team is assessing the next steps, including looking at projected student enrollment and the space needed to accommodate students. The roof of Meg's Middle School blew off and their HVAC, HVAC system was disconnected. The teams got to work right away, drying out the classrooms and preventing additional rain from further damaging the school. Lachlan Elementary Design Center also had roof damage, but it was not as extensive. Crews started to work on Wednesday and made repairs over the weekend in time for school to start on Monday. Even though the district offices were closed on Tuesday and Wednesday, I saw my colleagues spread across the city mobilizing to help communities through this crisis. Our schools that survived the tornado opened up to become supply distribution points. Our teachers, staff members, students, and families then deployed into neighborhoods to bring supplies. Our HERO program created an intake form to begin identifying families newly in need of support. The teams also packed food boxes and open cafeterias to serve hot meals to those neighbors in need from North Nashville to Donaldson to Hermitage. Meanwhile, each of our employees rose to be leaders of their areas and we began planning for what was necessary to reopen school on Monday. For the schools that had significant damage, they started packing and moving materials where there was space in other schools. In middle schools, lockers were packed and boxed by volunteers and teachers individually. We had moving companies donate movers and Amazon and Richards and Richards donated boxes. The response from, from employees at all levels was unbelievable. People worked through the weekend packing classrooms, moving furniture and setting up new classrooms. We knew it was possible in Nashville, but no one from the outside would have guessed that we could ever have made it happen by Monday morning to open up our doors. I'm gonna pause for just a moment and say, if you are here and you participated in any of these efforts, would you please stand for a moment? Incredible, we thank each and every one of you. And for those of you watching, there was nearly everyone in this room, so, so thank you. On Monday morning, students from three schools entered new school buildings where they were welcomed by other students. Park Avenue Elementary School will be housed at Robert Churchwell Museum Magnet through May 2020. As you voted on this evening, we propose a plan to combine Graymar and Jerry Baxter into one building for the 2020-21 school year to give the schools more resources. As a result of the tornado, we needed to accelerate that process to combine the schools immediately. We held a previously scheduled community meeting on Thursday, March 5th to talk about the changes. The schools will operate separately through this school year under the same roof and then combine to become one school in August 2020. Due to the size of Meg's Magnet Middle, we needed to find space large enough for, the, for their students. Graymar's building was the only realistic option and Meg's reopened there on Monday. Due to the quick work of the maintenance and school teams, Lachlan Elementary Design Center was able to reopen their entire building at the same time as the rest of the district. As you can see, I am very happy to report that all of our schools are back up and running this week. Students, teachers, staff, and families are dealing with new realities at six of our schools, and they are dealing with them magnificently. So thank you to everyone at Churchwell, Graymar, Jerry Baxter, Lachlan, Meggs, and Park Avenue for the patience, collaboration, work ethic, and spirit of accommodation that you've shown over the past week. You know that a school is more than just a building. 
More than anything, it's the people who come together every day to teach and learn. I also want to thank all of you on the board for your leadership and support over the past week. You've, you've all had our backs and you've had the community's back. Thank you. Thank you also to Mayor Cooper, Metro Council members, Nashville Electric Service, and many Metro departments for all of the help and support you've extended to us. Keep answering the phone when we call. <laughs> and most of all, thank you all to all of our MPS employees, students, and families for showing that we are Nashville strong, and more specifically, MPS strong. They have expressed personal pain and loss, and they're still dedicating their all to each other and the students. This has been a week we'll never forget, but it will also go down as a week when we became stronger by showing that we can handle anything that life or Mother Nature throws at us. There's nothing like being part of a great team, and that's what we have here at Metro National Public Schools. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Battle. Ms. Buck? Yeah, I have a question. So with the potential rebuilding of, of Churchwell, the renovation of um, Meg's, Will insurance pay for that? I know we don't have much left in our, we already, we don't have capital needs money. <laughs> I'll, I'll let the experts. I'm just curious, I'm sorry. I just want to know what we need to be ready for. Like. Yeah. We do have, we do have some available capital funding that have, has not been allocated specifically to this project that we can use and then we anticipate reimbursement either through insurance okay. or through the uh, FEMA or some other source. Okay. And if I can add one more celebration. So in the midst of this, we've managed to have four of our varsity high school teams make it to the state tournament. So shout out to Pearl Cone, East and Hillsboro boys varsity teams, as well as Maplewood <laughs> girls varsity team. So in the midst of this, they still rally together. Uh, for real, put them up. Okay, I do have a, um, a short board's chair report tonight, if I can find it. Ed. Okay. Um, I'm going to repeat a little bit of what um, Dr. Battle said. Um, we were hit by E3 tornado last Tuesday morning about 1 a.m. Um, it was a tornado that... Uh, was vastly more powerful and more destructive than the one that hit in 1998. And I do remember that one very well. And in true Nashville fashion, volunteers showed up on Tuesday morning to begin helping their less fortunate neighbors. It was heartwarming. I can't, they put the tissues by the right person, by the way. <laughs> it was so heartwarming to see our MMPS tissues and staff helping their colleagues and students clean up their houses and yards so they could get back to some semblance of normalcy. Uh, so many food vendors brought hot meals to the storm victims and their workers. I saw Med, uh, McGavick High School teachers cleaning debris out of their colleagues' yards and their students' yards. I saw the, the principal at McGavick with a chainsaw in his hand. He's a good old farm boy from Texas, so he knows how to use a chainsaw. Um, I applaud Dr. Battle and his and her staff for making the decisions to consolidate schools that are uh, no longer um, habitable for their students. These are not easy decisions, but they are necessary ones. I praise the communication staff for ensuring that our parents and employees knew what the MMPS plans were. I can't tell you how many social media posts I got. I saw that said, wow, we have a communications team that actually knows how to communicate to parents and staff. And that was wonderful. Um, we really do appreciate that. And if that weren't enough, we have now the coronavirus, you know, in Middle Tennessee. So, you know, we're, it's, it's just keeping on. But, you know, Nashville, Nashville showed up and we showed everybody who we are. We're still doing it. Um, I was exchanging text messages up until Tuesday afternoon with Mr. Prophet because we had one lone MMPS school that didn't have power. Of course, it was in my district. And, you know, I was watching the clock, you know, making sure that it was gonna be up and running 
for Monday morning. So, and it was, and it was. So I sent him a picture of the NAS trucks in the driveway at Stanford Montessori, and, and yes, they got power. So, you know, every, all the schools had, that needed to open, opened. And so we have, Nashville has proved time and time again that we will overcome our challenges presented to us and makes me proud to call Nashville home. Uh, secondly, tonight we voted on and approved a new timeline for selecting our permanent director of schools, and I think it's important for this board to honor the selection process. Um, unfortunately, we were only to get one of five interviews done last week before Mother Nature dealt us, you know, that devastation. So we are at the mercy of, of the remaining candidates for their schedule. So um, this will be on our board calendar, but uh, Dr. Battle will be um, this coming Thursday. Dr. Rod Richmond will be Thursday the 26th. Brenda Elliott will be Tuesday the 31st. And Brian Kingsley will be Thursday, April the 2nd. Then on our first meeting in April on the 14th, we will have a decision on our permanent director of schools. And so um, that concludes my board report. We'll go into announcements and I'll start with Ms. Howard. Thank you. So um, I'd like to extend my appreciation for Village Church and Tusculum Church of Christ. Uh, Village Church paid the lunch balances for both Cranberry and Creve Hall Elementary, um, and they were incredibly gracious and thoughtful when doing so. Additionally, the largest lunch debt that we had at MMPS was at uh, Oliver Middle School, and Tusculum Church of Christ paid for it. So I am so grateful and thankful to both of these churches for their generosity and uh, being an example of love thy neighbor to our students and families. Um, speaking of Oliver, their sixth grade intermediate, intermediate I should know that because I was in this band, but not at Oliver, intermediate band, uh, received superior ratings at their MTSBOA concert performance assessment. And uh, as many of as you as many of you know, uh, Oliver's band is well known, but Overton's band is also well known. And to that note, uh, I need to congratulate Alina Miller. She is the Overton band director, and she was named a CMA Foundation Music Teacher of Excellence. And on a very interesting note, she and her mother were both. Um, who her mother is named Anna Miller or Anna Miller, I might be saying that incorrectly. And she's the orchestra, orchestra teacher at Hume Fogg and they were both uh, named as a CMA teacher of excellence. So I think that's really cool and we appreciate the Miller family and their commitment to fine arts inside of MMPS and the incredible work that they're doing for our students. Um, additionally, I have a long list and I apologize because I know this is already a long meeting, um, but Overton really rocked it at DECA, um, the Tennessee chapter meetings just happened earlier this month and currently Gabby Rochelle who is a senior at John Overton she serves as the 2019-2020 secretary um, obviously that's ending as the new school year approaches and a new leadership was elected and Austin Critch was who is a senior at John Overton was uh, elected as the president of DECA so they continue to have not only students that are inside the leadership of Tennessee DECA's chapter but they also have many students that won individual competitions at the State Career Development Conference. So those students are uh, Jalen Martin and Catrice McMullen, who placed third in financial services team decision making. Uh, Anna Cavney and Patricia Harrison and Angie Toledo, who placed fourth in integrated marketing campaigns and services. Vatsal Basfar and Ellis Bosco, who placed second in marketing management and team decision making. Austin, who is also, we just mentioned as the new president of DECA, and Gabby Rochelle, who placed third in the sales project, and Simone Hill and Tatiana Miller and Jaden Willoughby for placing fourth in sports and entertainment, marketing and operations research. I greatly apologize if I missed anybody. I went through all 38 pages and I think I got it right. <laughs> um, but I think I have everyone that placed. Um, and then um, I obviously have a lot of thank you notes and congratula congratulation notes to send out, um, but that's only because of the greatness that's found within MMPS and that was so on display last year as we have all uh, heard. So it's hard to imagine the force that caused the destruction that we saw, but Nashville and MMPS is a force. And so I know that we will continue to do our best work and I hope uh, I look forward to us all doing that. Thanks. Ms. Pippa Walker. Um, I want to start by giving uh, Hillsborough a shout out for making it to the state tournament. 
We're on, we're on. We're on. We're on. Uh, and uh, I want to thank um, the West End PTO for organizing a uh, cluster-wide um, sort of gathering of supplies and, re and materials to take to North Nashville last week. We had many, 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 many van loads and also the Hillsboro Band trailer came and we filled that up. That was awesome. Uh, congratulations to the Hillsboro Drama um, Group for Catch Me If You Can performance last week. And I also want to say thanks to all of the incredible MMPS staff and the facilities people and everybody and leadership team, everybody for all the hard work, the endless hours. So very proud of everybody. Thank you, Ms. Boggs. Thank you. So I have the honor and privilege of serving uh, as a District 5 representative. Unfortunately, that encompasses both East Nashville and a bit of North Nashville, both of which were hit. Um, don't worry, I'm good. I had a little bit of roofing damage, but insurance is going to pay for that, so I'm good. But there are so many families who don't have that. And so I want to just make you aware there's a, a campaign movement by a coalition of groups called Don't Sell Out North, and it's um, specifically targeting North Nashville families. I mean, literally, canvassers are going and knocking on doors to check on, uh, to check on residents to assess damage, because I don't know that we've been able to do that as a city yet, but then also to remind them of their rights as renters and or as homeowners. So if you know someone that's, that's at all dealing with any kind of damage and is being approached by developers, uh, it's not that the community is asking them just not to sell if it's beneficial to them, but to make sure that community members are educated and that they have access to lawyers, uh, access to city services, codes. So follow the hashtag on social media. It's just don't sell out north. We are talking about uh, how we can better support East Nashville in that same endeavor because what we don't want to happen is we ignore that side of town or even ignore the Hermitage Donaldson areas. Um, and think that, that, th that those residents are not also being targeted by developers. So something to keep in mind, uh, FEMA is in the city, yay, yes. They are at Lee Chapel African Methodist Episcopal Church from today until Thursday uh, in the parking lot from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., but they are floating around the city. That's just one that I know. Please continue to share whatever resources or services you hear about. Uh, I have a quick story just because it kind of tells this, the, it tells this disparity story excuse me, story really well. Uh, at my house, we heard it at, at 1 a.m., went back to sleep, woke up to pictures of the devastation, uh, tried to drive down Jefferson Street to get to North Nashville and just saw <coughs> devastation. I mean, there's no other way to describe it. I mean, tr trees on top of cars, um, houses blocked by trees. And I saw Council Member Brandon Taylor and a member of Mayor Cooper's team, Eric Brown, they had made a roadblock at Hyman. People thought that Hyman was a drive-through, like a cut-through in the neighborhood, but I mean, there were trees everywhere, power lines dangling, I mean, sparks flying. And I just appreciated this, these two community members seeing a need and meeting the need. They felt like North Nashville had not been getting, had not been, the the station had not been publicized, so they did something about it. They tried to support their community. They did an all call. Lee Chapel became a hub. Procone became a hub. I mean, and we just had an influx of volunteers. So this just speaks to the level, the type of advocacy and the type of volunteer spirit that Nashville has. But please speak up. Do, do something, say something, it's okay. You know, there will be people that can come and support you, but sometimes it takes just one person saying that my community needs something more. Um, I wanna uh, echo you all that the administration and teachers that I ran into, sweaty Dr. Williams, uh, Dr. Stu you weren't really sweaty, you looked great. But uh, I mean, he's just one that I saw, but uh, Matthew Portell literally showed up with a truck full of stuff, but he also had two random teachers who he didn't know in the car with him. I thought they were, they were his family, but so uh, just, Anyone that was that volunteered, we appreciate you. But I've also heard in the community people who felt bad that they couldn't volunteer. Please understand, this is a marathon, not a sprint. There will be opportunities for you to plug in and support families. I think we as a board will continue to just kind of push those messages out as we see and hear needs. Uh, Hume Fog does have 20 families that are being supported that have either lost everything or had significant damage. So I would just say if you're someone that maybe doesn't have a lot of time or is not able to lift, I don't know, trees off of roofs, you could very easily just reach out to your community school, reach out to your neighborhood school, the school down the street, and say, what is it that a family in your area needs? I think that would be extremely helpful. Um oh, I do want to uh, shout out the, the Day on the Hill. 
it, it's like I plugged it at the last board meeting, it happened the next day, and then we weren't able to really celebrate all those community members. MNEA came out to support, they had great questions, both Michelle and Amanda, I don't, if Amanda might be gone, but we had just, uh, we were able to engage our state legislators and really unpack what it means for the governor to say that we're gonna have $200 million for teacher pay raises, but that really means that Nashville is gonna lose money. I mean, little things like that, that as an advocate, it, it helps me to better understand, you know, what the talking points are, how to disparage rumors, how to make sure that I'm putting out actual, accurate information to my constituents. So thank you all for showing up. Anyone that didn't want to, or that wanted to, but wasn't able to, we are trying to make this more of a tradition. So thank you, Mr. North and, Mr. and Dr. Severe for supporting that effort. Um, the Magnet School Showcase happened uh, the Friday before the storm, and that Magnet School Showcase was our elementary school MSAP recipients. So that meant Witsit, uh, Glenn Gary. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's not one of my schools. Warner. No, I, I yeah, know my, my school's school. right. I, I know mine, but I just didn't know the others. But so you yeah, had Whitsick, Glencliff, Rosebank. Rosebank Warner, and I know mine, Rosebank Warner and Inglewood. But it was really, really nice to see, I mean, students being able to showcase that extra influx of money, what it has done to their school, how it's been able to um, shift the narrative in their community about, because they are those are community schools that were under-enrolled and now are seeing a spike in enrollment. Um, you know, we'll continue to shout out Warner and Dr. Gibbs and his team, but the reason that they've been able to see these stark gains and go from a priority school to a school that will likely be a reward school is because of this influx of dollars. So thank you to those, uh, those families that came out that evening. Thank you to the, the students that performed. True. Uh, so, so last Monday, I was reading to students at Robert Churchwell, in fact, in that very wing that is now gonna be torn down and um, there was a, a great sense of pride about the school. They're very gracious to us. They had little little bags of goodies for us. And um, and I ended up back there a few days later to see the devastation firsthand, to see the neighborhood and the schools. And it, it really is um, impactful to see what people are living through up there. Um, I woke up at uh, in the middle of the night, early morning Tuesday, to find out that my own family in East Nashville had been impacted by the tornado. And um, so my family ended up helping in Donaldson and North Nashville and East Nashville last week. Um, we, in, in, our, in my cluster, we have about 150 kids and, uh, who attend Hillwood High School who are from the North Nashville area. We have a lot of other kids at our uh, elementary and middle schools. And so by the next morning, by Tuesday, my entire community had sprung into action and I have never been prouder of my community because we had distribution boxes out immediately. We had trailer upon trailer going to North Nashville, going to Pearl Cone, going to churches. We had um, distribution center set up just elaborate um, uh, uh, organization that was going on in, in several different schools. We had uh, folks going out. We had uh, middle schoolers going out to clean up neighborhoods. I mean, just really amazing work going on. So last week, um, uh, people in my district, we collected food, supplies, including flashlights, sleeping bags, toiletries, blankets. Um, all that was taken up to North Nashville. We went to a church uh, parking lot where we served a donated meal for 200 people. Uh, we, I washed clothes in my house for a new friend in North Nashville. Um, we delivered toys. Uh, I watched teachers and PTO members, parents moving classrooms. We raised some money. Um, and just for, for me, this was a, a, it was a privilege to give back because we were flooded in 2010 and had the same experience. Just amazing numbers of volunteers that showed up our house. So um, I do want to thank um, Dr. Battle for her excellent leadership last week. Um, I ran into her twice in North Nashville when I was there and she was just out and about and, and handled it superbly. Um, I'd like to thank our teachers and support staff for all of the extra work they put in and everybody just showed up and did their part and more than their part. Our, communi our communication staff was excellent and I'm just really proud of my community and MMPS as a whole and everyone that was involved in all the efforts last week and thank you, I'm proud to be part of Nashville and MMPS. Bush. Well, I tell you, this lady over here, I had to try to keep up with her community. <laughs> uh, I was on Facebook and I just started seeing it, all these amazing kids, her entire district, and I was just so impressed with Amy and what she, what they did out there. And I'll tell you, I've slept right through the storm and I woke up that morning, Dr. Battle probably 
thought I was crazy. And I woke up and said, why are we closing schools because of elections? Because I didn't know about this storm and how uh, just how horrible it was because I did not know. And, but I didn't get a chance to get out and see the devastation um, because I have a teacher on maternity leave, so I haven't I have been in the classroom. So I didn't know except for looking at all the pictures and it was just horrible. And of course, Putnam County, you know, got the worst um, loss of life. And it just broke my heart. And of course, kids um, died and uh, complete families. Um, so I came home on that Wednesday uh, night and I just sat there and I prayed. And I said, well, what can I do? What, what can we do as a community? Because as you all know, uh, 1998 and now 2020, Southeast Nashville has been very, we've been spared. Um, we have been very blessed and uh, have not experienced the devastation um, like uh, our neighbors. Uh, so I got on the phone and I started thinking, what can I do? And again, Amy, she made a step up there and I just thought to myself, you know, this is just amazing what her community is doing and how fast they did it. And I start calling and I called a good friend of mine because before I became a board member, I was a community leader. Um, I did a lot of work with the council uh, members in our community and I just know, uh, hey, how to do this? How can I organize this? But I need people to help. And I called a good friend of mine, Karen Van Cleves, and I just said, hey, I need your help. What do you think about this idea about us coming together as Southeast Davidson uh, gives love is what I thought about. And um, she said, hey, let's do it. And of course, you need more partners. You need trucks. You need um, to get the word out on social media. And uh, I immediately, she said, you know what? You stay put and I will call you right back. And when she called me back, she had um, Lakeshore Christian Church on board, uh, um, CNAP on board, which is one of our biggest organizations out there to do a lot of work in our community. Um, she had Ben Freeland, who was going to donate the trucks. Um, it was just incredible. And, of course, we had... Um, Frida, I called her and I said, hey, you want to, you know, join ventures with me on this? And uh, she said, sure, absolutely. I would love to. So I was really excited to have another school board in our district in Southeast Davidson to join this, this efforts to help our neighbors across the city. So we did. And I put it out on social media and I kept thinking to myself, I don't know how much uh, participation we're going to get, but we're going to do this thing. And we were going to meet over at Lakeshore Christian Church. And I tell you, the line of cars and how consistent people were coming out just to donate, to donate. And it wasn't just in Southeast. It was uh, Smyrna, Laverne. Uh, people were just coming out. And I was just so amazed of filling up two truckloads of goods for our neighbors, too. And it was just incredible to see neighbors come together. We had Antioch High School who showed out. Clarissa came. She brought extra things from when they did their uh, drive. Um, we had uh, principals from across the town. Uh, we had teachers to come out in our district. So it was incredible. Um, Frida got on, uh, got on top of one of those trucks. You know, she wanted to take a picture. I wasn't going to be that brave because I know how clumsy I am, but she got up there and I, we snapped some pictures of her. But it was just incredible to see everybody come together and it was it was just a huge blessing. I have my kids out there because, of course, we want to show our kids, like Amy said, to make sure that they're involved and understand what devastation looks like and what we do to help each other. But I also want to do something that I don't think we've ever done before, but I want this whole room to say girl power. One, two, three. Girl, girl, girl power. I can't hear you. One, two, three. Girl power. Okay, one more time. One, two, three. Girl, girl power. To Adrian Battle. <laughs> to Dr. Battle. Can we give her a hand for all the things she did? I've never seen, and I think this should be nationally recognized, that someone that can move schools as an interim. Oh my goodness, that can move schools the way she did and our kids and still walk around in her heels. <laughs> and when I saw her on TV or pictures, I was thinking, she still have on heels? <laughs> and she walked those schools and she um, worked with her teachers, our teachers, staff. I mean, just a number of so many officials across this city, um, our government. I mean, it was just incredible to see her do what she did. So I just want to tell you thank you because I know you did not get any 
any rest. And I know you still have two young babies at home, and I just can't imagine how you just did not get no rest. But she still looks like this, right? So that's girl power for you, right? So I just want to say thank you to everybody, and uh, we are, you know, this city is going to rebound like we've done before, and it just takes all of us. And, you know, sometimes, you know, we lose things that we don't want to lose, and um, but sometimes it's, it it happens because we need to get shaken up a little bit so that we can all can come we all can come together and and understand the reason why we're here on this earth. So I just want to tell you guys, thank you, thank you for doing what you do in this city and continue your efforts. And uh, that's all for me. Thank you guys. Um, first, just echo everyone says, Dr. Battle, and to the staff, um, I know sometimes the staff doesn't get the recognition you need being part of supporting Dr. Battle, but thank you. I know I've been in your shoes, so I understand, not to this extent, <laughs> but in a very minor way, so I understand the work you did, so thank you, because you took time away from your families to, to dedicate time to, um, to the community, so to the staff, thank you for stepping up um, when to answer the call along with Dr. Battle. Um, and light hands make, you know, many hands make light work, the just said, and we saw it, and I went to Robert Churchwell, and I was kind of, Christian put a post about walking around and looking like, look like you're a stranger, because like there was just so many people helping that it was hard to find one task because you want other people to do it, and that's a great blessing to have. Um, so thank you to everyone. Um, and to the STEM showcase, Christian was there with me, and so two of my schools were there, Glencliff Elementary. <laughs> <laughs> And with the, uh, but I say that I love. Um, we had a great time. It was cute. They even, I guess, almost um, fortuitously had a natural disaster with their Legoland model. So maybe that was fortuitous moment on Friday night to going here. But it was a great event um, that, that was had to see all the children to talk about their STEM projects and show the arts that they were doing that it was warm to the heart and brought back many memories as me as a kid having to perform. Um, and then also um, coming up um, April 4th, there'll be Easter egg, egg hunt at South the East Community Center from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. So hopefully in the future, something to lift everybody's spirits and hearts. Um, you'll hear more information coming that in the future. So that's all I have. I just have a couple. I just want to express that um, our thoughts and prayers are with Mr. Jeff Davis. He's the um, assistant principal at um, DuPont Tyler Middle School. And he is terminal with, with brain cancer, and um, I understand that he's been moved into inpatient hospital hospice care, and I just want um, he and his family to know that um, we're thinking about him and, and them as they struggle through this difficult time in their lives. It's, he's a delightful person and um, very young, and he is, and his wife are, are, are just really good people, as, as they, my grandmother used to say. Also, two rivers... A DuPont. a DuPont Hadley. I'm sorry, I get my DuPonts confused. Um, and also, Two Rivers Middle School is in desperate need of supplies for their food pantry. They lost electricity, so and they're one of the rare ones that has um, a freezer with uh, meat items in it, and they lost all that because they lost electricity, and they tried to give it away to community members who were in need. So they need their, their uh, freezer restocked, and they need their pantry shelves restocked. Spring break is coming up next week. Friday's a half a day of school, and so... Um, Nicole Vaughn is their community. She's coordinator, and she is just impressive. And she put out a plea, and so I, you know, put put it back out there. And um, if you can bring by food items, um, it's on my school board Facebook page. Uh, what they need for their freezer and their pantry, or you can go to Kroger and buy a gift card and. Nicole will be happy to do the shopping for you. So, you know, just make sure her name is on uh, the envelope. So if anyone can help in, in light of, we have around 30 uh, homeless families in that particular school. So anything is much appreciated. So with that being said, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you for being here. So I heard that you went to go visit him. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.